All right. Good morning, everybody. Let's start Raymond. There we go. Thank you. Uh, today is June 13th, and we are uh, here at the District of Squamish Committee of the Whole. My name is Jenna Stoner. As acting mayor this month, I'll be chairing this meeting. Hot Squalin, Quisluk, Tumuk, Tlaskohomish, Okmeo. We are recognizing that we are meeting and doing our work today on the traditional unceded territorial lands of the Squamish people. Um, today in particular, June is Indig Indigenous, uh, National Indigenous History Month, and so I want to take some time in our land acknowledgement to recognize really just the long history, complex history that the Squamish Nation has in the lands that we are working on today. Uh, I've been doing a fair bit of reading, but um, in particular, Really just recognizing their oldest uh, archaeological site is 8,600 years old, and that's at Porto Cove. And just really thinking about the length of time that that really spans. We often say time immemorial, but that is a really, really long time. And so as we advance our work today, just keeping in mind that really long history that the Squamish Nation has on these lands um, is particularly important, especially in National Indigenous History Month. Just wanted to reflect on that. Um, can I uh, ask for a motion for adoption of the agenda today, please? Moved by Councillor Greenlaw, seconded by Councillor French. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, we will start off uh, our meeting today with uh, a series of staff reports, but first up is Ms. Murray on the Union of BC Municipalities 2023 Convention Minister Meeting Requests. And I believe she has a few slides for us and then we'll get into Council discussion. Thank you. Just a reminder to use your microphone when you're ready. No rush. I'll pull up my PowerPoint. Sorry for the delay. Good morning, Council. Um, I am Terry Murray. I'm an executive assistant here at the District of Squamish. And I would just like to go through a few slides uh, summarizing the uh, UBCM uh, minister meeting process. Um, for those of you who are new to Council, I'm just going to give a few, uh, present a few slides on the process and how it works and what we're going to ask of Council today. Sorry, Terry, can I just get you to reorient your microphone a little bit? Just so it's sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. So the UBCM uh, convention provides an opportunity for municipal governments to um, meet with provincial ministers uh, on topics that are important to them. This process uh, happens, uh, the minister meeting process happens through the UBCM uh, online portal. And um, it's important to note that all minister meeting requests are due by June 30th of this year. So that is why we're in front of council today. Um, the staff to staff meetings or uh, district staff to um, ministry staff, those uh, meeting requests must be uh, in place by August 30th. And um, just as a side note, ministers will consider meeting with you on three uh, topics per meeting. Uh, however, I have um, since realized that you don't get any more than 15 minutes, no matter how many topics you have for a minister. So even though you have three topics, you get to fit them all into that 15 min minute minister meeting. Um, so if you do have multiple uh, requests for one minister, um, they do ask that you rank your requests in order of importance um, and most likely you're not going to get all three so um, it's important to to let them know which one is most important to you um, in the request to the minister we need to let them know which staff will be um, in attendance and which counselor will be in attendance so that's something we're going to ask you to to decide today 
and a, just a little bit of process. Um, the minister meeting requests, like I said, are all forms. So we can't provide them with a bunch of background reports or um, too much information. They're not going to read it. So this is just a little bit of a summary of um, the, the characters uh, per topic that we're uh, allowed to ask for. So um, we have to be very uh, succinct in our request to the ministers. So throughout the year, staff have um, taken note of any um, minister meetings that uh, council has requested throughout the year. These are the two that we have um, on file. So the first one was a council uh, motion from March of this year, um, and it is regarding um, the lack of provincial funding for transit expansions. So that is one we have on the books. And the second just happened uh, just shortly ago at the June 6th meeting where we are asking for um, a minister meeting regarding uh, speed enforcement on Highway 99. And what we're asking council for today is uh, to consider if there's additional uh, minister meetings required uh, to, for council to determine which staff and councillors will be at each specific minister meeting to prioritize the, uh, the topics and um, just so you know, we do have set some time aside on June 20th to further this discussion if need be. Um, so a chance to, to discuss it today and we can finalize it on the 20th if, if need be. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, and I'll let you to it. Wonderful, thanks so much for the overview. That's really helpful both for reminding council as well as the community as to how this process works. I saw Councillor Pettingill's hand, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. We have some uh, resolutions going forward from LMLGA through the UBCM and my recollection is we often try and meet on those topics with ministers as well. Is that something we would want to do? I guess that's a question to everyone. <laughs> Uh, we've definitely had a varied approach in the past. If there's ones that are particularly important and, and time sensitive, I think we often elevate them to a minister meeting. We also balance that with other requests or um, needs that I think we've identified over the year. So if there's one or two that you feel particularly strong about, definitely feel free to bring it to the table. Mayor Herford, go ahead. Thank you. I think. Um... I'm going to ponder that one through throughout the rest of the discussion and just look at it on on balance as we do have some um, some motions that have ad advanced through the LMLGA process. But um, I'm just thinking about the timeliness, uh, you know, and the, ur the urgency of those versus the longer um, just where they where they fit. But um, so if, we, if it's OK, we set those aside for now and then we can kind of come back to them after the rest. Uh, unless someone feels um, strongly about those and we could elevate one of them or all of them now, but I'm just going to sort of see where we see where we land and how, how our list is, is, um, is shaping up. So in addition to the two resolutions that we have from previous council meetings, which I think are both probably targeted to MOTI, uh, are there other items that people would like to bring forward uh, that they think are necessary for minister meetings at this time. Council French, go ahead. Uh, I would like to hear from staff uh, any thoughts around whether or not it would be productive, helpful, advanced things uh, if we were to meet with the advanced education minister on the quest situation. Go ahead, CAO Glenda. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, through the chair. Uh, that's a great question, and I don't actually have the answer. But um, if there's an opportunity for staff to, I believe council's coming back again to talk about this. We can bring you more fulsome information. And maybe the mayor has some thoughts on this as well. As I think there have been some meetings in the background with some movers and shakers that are concerned about the future of the university lands. I think, um, I think things are developing 
there and I'm thinking of the time frame that we have um, for this meeting between the, the gap between our ask and the meeting um, and what the landscape is. So um, I think I'll, I think for, for this, I'll um, get that staff perspective is, is important and the moving on sort of the moving pieces, but um, things do seem to be moving there. I just wonder if the, how much the discussion will have evolved by the time we get to uh, the September, the September date. So um, I welcome the conversation at the next meeting. Uh, I'll just make a few comments and I'll go back to you, Councillor Pettingill. So I did have uh, putting some thought into this, a few additions I wanted to make uh, for consideration by council for additional meetings. Um, one would be a joint meeting with environment and climate change and the energy mines, low carbon innovation ministries, um, as we have done in the past uh, to again, touch base on our challenges with the EA process with respect to wood fiber and Fortis BC. I think this continues to be timely. It's something that we have continued to do provincial advocacy on, um, but I think it's important that we remain at the table and continue to elevate that issue. Um, so that's one that I would like council to consider. Yeah, go ahead, Council French. Uh, on that, um, previously at UBCM um, meetings, on this particular topic, um, and Mayor Elliott was particularly um, good about this, uh, we had a tradition of having balanced representation in such meetings. I'd like to see that continued. Thank you for the note. Um, the other uh, topics that I would like to add for, for consideration to a meeting with MOTI, and I think we'll have to do some prioritization here, um, but we have consistently can continue to bring to the table some of the highway intersection issues in particular i think we continue to hear about mamcom road and alice lake are two that raised the top for me but there may be others that may be better suited in a staff to staff meeting um but i do think it's something that we should be addressing with moti at ubcm um, and then the other one that is relevant to a topic that is later on our agenda today is uh, public access at daryl bay um, and I think that that will continue to be uh, an important topic to raise with the province as well. Uh, and that might warrant some time with the minister uh, at UBCM, given the timing of the discussion and the needs that are identified in the marine access review study for our community. Um, so I'll put those out there for consideration by council, but that makes a long list for MOTI. So we'll have to take something off the table. Go ahead, Councillor Greenlaw. Um, I'd, I'd just like to add to, to your comment about uh, speaking to the energy mines and low carbon innovation. I would really like to see some modifications for the public engagement process. Um, so I'd like to have some conversations around that. It really needs to be modified and modernized. Okay, I see Councillor Anderson, go ahead. Yes, I'm looking at the suggested, uh, recommend, the, uh, the council member meeting request to date uh, slide from staff. Uh, and the second item was that the issue of automated speed enforcement on Highway 99 be added to the list of topics for discussion. I suggest, and this follows from our discussion last week, that there is more to bring up regarding Highway 99, namely when an accident does happen. We have uh, had a correspondent point out communications issues, lack of U-turn issues, and the fact that when we have an accident, more accidents happen because of the lack of uh, procedure and facilities on the highway to respond to cases of accident. And so I would suggest that the it is not only the automated speed enforcement, but additional highway safety issues uh, to prevent and uh, to respond to accidents. Councillor Pattingill, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, actually, Councillor Stoner, you took most of my uh, <laughs> meeting ideas. The one, uh, and it's not fully fledged, but we do hear a lot of concern as we look to address our housing crisis with that, you know, provincial, um, like schools and hospitals and all that provincial infrastructure isn't keeping up. And I wonder if there's a conversation there um, about, you know, the province making more clear what they're bringing to the table, how they're making sure those things are aligned, because it feels like we're sort of trying to um, deal with that provincial information to the public to make the public understand that, which makes our jobs more challenging. And, and so 
I, I don't know if, if that's the one we I, I fight to the death to bring to the, the meetings, but it, it does it is something that comes up a fair bit. Um, so I just want to put that on the table. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hamilton, I see your hand. So we'll go to you next and then we'll go to Mayor Hartford. Yeah, thanks. Um, another thing, and I, and I don't know the status of this from a staff perspective or where this where these conversations might be with the with the province, so it might not be quite appropriate. Um, but is the um, recreation sites around Squamish um, having additional provincial camping sites, uh, managing things like Brome Lake and Cat Lake, uh, finding ways to more effectively use those those resources? Yeah, that's a great flag. That is one that we have previously brought up with the province as well. But um, uh, given that we have our ongoing work at the round table, the visitor management round table, um, and there are some additional sites that have happened this year, but definitely not enough to address the overall demand. So we can circle back with staff and just see if uh, and raising this to the ministerial level would be helpful on an ongoing basis. Thank you for flagging that. Uh, I have Mayor Herford and then I have Councillor French. Go ahead, Councillor French. I uh, just want to point out on that topic uh, that Councillor Hamilton has brought up, Parliamentary Secretary for Environment Kelly Green uh, wrote the mayor for sure and possibly council a few months ago on this issue, indicating she would be happy to meet and discuss in detail. So I, I think th this particular topic with this particular minister is probably a no-brainer in light of the fact that she indicated she wants to talk to us about it. Great, thank you. Mayor Harper, go ahead. Thank you. I had uh, camping again or still in question mark for, for my list and um, exactly which um, direction to push on that I think is worth is worth exploring. Um, I do think that um, our childcare um, needs, we, we just went through a process where we were successful in getting those spots um, funded in Valley Cliff and that construction underway, but um, we need we need more, and I think this is an area where uh, we've been picking up some of the slack through our CAC policy, and the province uh, really needs to come um, continue to push there, um, so um, we can focus um, our efforts in in other areas that are directly our responsibility. Um, so I, I think the childcare discussion um, is warrants a uh, um, some att some attention here. Um, and Vancouver Coastal Health has taken on the, and sort of next topic is Vancouver Coastal Health has started this uh, master planning process um, for our health healthcare in our region. But I think that um, some advocacy to the Ministry of Health around um, uh, our, our community needs. So when they come out of that pro, so hopefully those needs are reflected in the master planning process, but they're not a, they're not a surprise. So that's the regional uh, nature of uh, of our of our hospital facilities and um, the challenges that that happen. Um, Minister of Transportation um, has been discussed earlier around highway closures and so on. When I think about community resiliency, um, having um, having our our hospital facilities here at uh, the highest level po um, possible, I think is um, is something worth worth elevating. And hopefully that'll be backed up by the outcome of the master planning process. But, um, you know, as we look at these um, pieces or all the areas of interest for, for us, we'll have to weigh out which, which make the cut. And perhaps that master planning process that's underway is, is enough, but I feel like some sort of um, sustained pressure there uh, and sustained advocacy is, would be worthwhile. Um, we already have the transit piece in there. Um, and um, I don't know, this ties to the how, I've been thinking about how, about housing, I mean, I think we all spend a lot of time thinking about housing um, a fair bit, and I wonder where, for me, as the province is um, moving forward with um, uh, these plans around housing with targets and and so on, it makes me, I'm concerned that we're, um, the other pieces aren't keeping up. Transit's a great example, like, yes, push, de push for density in units and plan around transit, but then the expanded transit service isn't uh, isn't flowing. So sort of keeping all those pieces moving. And I don't know if that's uh, um, so that we're not exasperating uh, or driving a wedge in current 
problems or pressures we have in our community. So I don't know if that's a, a um, sorry, a premier um, meeting because it's outside of all these silos. Sort of, they all need to move move together, or if that's a hub, or if that's um, inside the other pieces that we think need to need to move. But it's that healthcare is absolutely part of that. Transit's part. Transit's part of that. The childcare is part of that. And as we look at just sort of pull the um, stops out and let's and let's do more housing units. These other pieces need to 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 come along as well. And uh, I was curious to get council's opinion on how we address that that issue sort of more holistically so that um, to get that to get that point across because that is a piece that I think is really important. And yes, it exists in all these silos, but it's it's kind of um, Maybe big, maybe bigger than that, or requires potentially some higher level di direction than just inside those those ministries. So when we look at an all, we've heard of an all government response to housing crisis, but I'm not really seeing it, and that's something that I'd like to um, to explore. So I'd love to get uh, council's thoughts on um, on that sort of suite of issues <laughs> that are intertwined. Yeah, thanks for that. There's no shortage of things that definitely uh, we require collaborative uh, support with the province in order to effectively move forward on some of our biggest challenges in our community. I think one of the challenges with UBCM meetings is that they're 15 minutes in nature. And so we want to be very clear in what our ask is in what we're trying to get out of the meeting. There are also other opportunities through UBCM. Many of the ministers spend a day or two um, there's opportunities to chat with staff, uh, and so there's other ways to have some of those broader conversations. So appreciate wanting to highlight them, and there may be a particular ask there. I think from my perspective, it would probably be directed to the Ministry of Housing. It would be specifically around the housing targets that they're setting, um, and I do think that there's a real issue with them initiating the first pilot of the set, the first 10 municipalities that they're managing the housing targets with are all fairly large municipalities, and it's going to be really impactful when they try and use that same methodology for smaller communities. I think that is a real issue that we want to be cognizant of and could be one way to start to frame that conversation. Um, but I do think with eight minutes left in this conversation for on today's agenda, uh, we want to really narrow down uh, from council on what it is that we want to be asking for and who we want to be meeting with. So I'm just going to reflect back what I've heard from folks. Um, so we have rec sites uh, and camping directed to uh, Parliamentary Secretary Green. I can't remember what her, Kelly Green yet, but what her portfolio is actually called, but Parliamentary Secretary Green, specifically around additional camping sites in the area and managing uh, visitor uh, management. Uh, a joint meeting with environment and climate change and the Ministry of Energy Mines Low Carbon Innovation on wood fiber LNG and Fortis. Um, challenges with the process there and uh, public engagement and the expectations of our community. Um, MOTI, the list is growing long, uh, but highway intersection issues, Daryl Bay public access, uh, safety improvements and transit. My recommendation there is that we would potentially suggest moving highway intersection issues and safety improvements to a staff meeting and then keeping the other two items to a minister meeting. Um, we have a suggestion around meeting with health, uh, child care, but I wasn't clear what the asks were there, uh, and then a potential meeting with housing. Um, so going back to council on anything that they would like to take off the table, because uh, I think that's a pretty long list that we need to start walking back from. Go ahead, Councillor French. I want to put one on. Um, so from our most recent motion uh, regarding the highway and um, UBCM minister meetings, specifically uh, automated speed enforcement. I've been conversing with Carl Burr, the former mayor of Lions Bay on this, and he has suggested that Mike Farnworth, Solicitor General, uh, and he's got another portfolio in there, um, is the person to talk to uh, about this. So I, I would suggest that Minister Farnworth on automated speed. Go ahead, Councillor Greenlaw. Uh, through the chair, I I don't have reductions for you, but I have additions. 
Okay. Um, I, I get, I've never gone through the UBCM process, so I'm wondering if it would be worthwhile to talk to Citizen Services about like chat GBT and job protection for AI and advocate, advocate for that kind of stuff. Because there is a huge concern that increasing, increasing use of AI is going to basically get rid of a lot of jobs. Um, the Children and Family Deve Development and Education talk about childcare and increased support for families. So more $10 a day spaces, I'm assuming that's going to come as part of the ask and more funding for recreational facilities as well. Um, energy mines and, and low carbon and innovations as well as the environment and climate change st strategy that you're talking about. Um, Talking to them as well, I would like to have a conversation about at least reducing subsidies for oil and gas, if not eliminating them, and discuss the absurdity of pushing forward oil and gas projects in a time when we are experiencing unprecedented impacts from climate change, given that 3.3 million hectares of Canadian wildland have been burned down so far this year. That's what I got. Thank you. And while I appreciate the additions, we also want to make sure that they are in line with existing policy that we have within the district and direction that council has given. And so that's also the fine line of doing advocacy on behalf of our community, uh, on behalf of this council, is that we're trying to keep things in line with critical issues that we have identified uh, within this council table. So yes, there are big issues around subsidizing fossil fuel industry, and it has direct impacts on our community climate action plans, um, but we really want to keep it as as tangible to some of the immediacy in our community um, instead of some of those like really broader topics. My perspective that may, others may have differing opinions, but I think we'd also have a split vote on whether we could actually go to a minister with that level of advocacy around this table. Go ahead, Councillor Pangel. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, my experience thus far is is more broadly applicable things like that. We would push through uh, an LMLJ UBCM resolution and discuss with the whole body or with the minister. It's on, you know, a campsite at Alice Lake, sort of a very local issue. It tends to be how we've done it. Um, uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to thinking about advocating on broader topics one on one, but um, you know, that's sort of our, our practice has been. I just want to point out that it's Aman Singh um is the minister of parks now so kelly green went to fisheries uh she's no longer there um so i don't know if that impacts anything um just councillor stoner when you were speaking uh you know i wonder if we want to consider asking to be one of the 10 pilots uh, as a small community and with the thought that we would have a little more control of what that looks like and you know that might be appealing to the province is just um Maybe something worth considering. I think the 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 ship has sailed on that option. Uh, they have already been announced, and they are underway on a fairly tight timeline to get. Uh, and there's reasons why they pick those, pick those ten municipalities, but I think just elevating the issue to the province about the ten that they picked and the applicability of the methodology that then they'll create. Um, Okay, so looking at the time and where we're at, I think it's great that we may have some agenda time on June 20th. I don't think we're going to wrap it up here today. Um, but I think I'm going to go down the list that I have. What we need is actually council to champion some of these. And so we need, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the list. Uh, and if you're interested in participating in that topic, you're going to be responsible with coming up with a short summary of what the ask is going to be. And then we'll bring it back to the June 20th meeting. Um, we can connect you with staff if you do need some feedback. Um, they can help potentially support, but this is really a uh, council-led initiative with some, count with some staff support. So um, I'm just going to do this by like show of hands of who wants to lead on the various pieces. So rec sites and camping with Parliamentary Secretary of Parks. I see Andrew Hamilton. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Great. Uh, environment and climate change, energy mines, low carbon innovation. I will lead on that one if that's all right with folks. Uh, MOTI. Mayor Herford, thank you very much. If I don't see hands, I'm going to start volunteering people. Uh, and if you really do have objections, let me know. Um, child care. Uh, Councillor Greenlaw, thank you very much. Uh, Minister of Health. 
uh, uh, Mayor Herford's also going to take that one. I'll also just flag that we should probably circle back with um, the squamish Lowett Regional District in the um, Regional Health behalf. What's Cedar Sky Regional <laughs> Hospital District on that one? I think that um, they, and that might be an appropriate place for this minister meeting to actually happen, but I just wanted to, I wanted to raise it here to ensure that it happened somewhere if it didn't happen through that channel. That's great. Thank you very much. Uh, housing. I will, yeah, go ahead, Councillor Prangill. Is that where we're sort of trying to link together like transit and all these pieces, all the provincial pieces that need to fit to make that work? Is that the ask here is go ahead, Mayor Herford. Oh, yeah. I think that um, I think that it's important to to mention, but the focus could be on, um, as Councillor Stoner suggested, the um, that methodology uh, around the the pilot. Um, I also think that our housing needs study showing all um, the large amount of affordable housing units that we um, that we require going going forward as a community. Um, needs to be there so it's kind of there's at least three three things but i don't think that that overall piece should really be the um is appropriate to be the focus in in that um in that meeting and you know when i think about the provincial areas the child care and the affordable housing are things that our cac policies are really picking up the slack on and i think it's really important that we keep that we maintain the advocacy role which is really the role that we belong in that in those issues um in forums such as this or whenever they present themselves so, Councillor Pangel, I'm, how about we work on that one together? Does that work? Okay. Uh, and then I have uh, so, uh, Mike Farnworth, Councillor French. Thank you very much. That's on uh, Highway 99 safety improvements and speed over distance. Have I missed anything? Councillor Anderson, go ahead. I just wondered uh, whether we might uh, recall that we've suggested that some of the MOTI components might be farmed out to staff. We can, of course, discuss this next time around, and that might include the highway speed. Uh, I'll also just put my name forward for MOTI uh, liaison. Thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Pangel. Uh, yeah, two things. One, Daryl Bay, and I don't know if we want to wait until we see this afternoon's presentation and decide on that and maybe ask staff to take that one. I'm not sure. Uh, I did have one other one, actually, and maybe we'll just have to discuss it next time, which I'd highlighted. It's the one I didn't mention, but the whole idea of getting uh, access to pipeline risk information, uh, because we have to decide our zoning around that. It's been a constant struggle. So, you know, talking to the province about what does it take for us to get the information we need to make our local zoning decisions? Yeah, I think that's something that we can fold into the joint uh, minister request for environment and climate change. If you think that's the appropriate two ministries to address it to, or is there somebody else that you would like that to go to? Uh, the, the mining and, uh, energy and blah, 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 that one. Yeah. Okay. We will fold that into the joint minister meeting request for environment, climate change, energy, mines, low carbon innovation. It's a mouthful. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I think that gets us a plan at least to get to a June 20th meeting uh, so that if you have been uh, identified as a lead, please come with a uh, two sentence summary of the request for the minister meeting for the June 20th meeting. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Murray, for getting us all set up and on track. Uh, and for council for the discussion and continued interest in provincial advocacy to make sure that all of these issues come to the forefront. Um, next up on our agenda, we have a North Crumpet update. So Mr. Gunn is here. Uh, I think he has a few short slides just to kick us off, but Council, you'll remember that um, sections of the North Crumpet Neighborhood Plan update uh, were previously referred from our special business meeting to a future committee of the whole for further discussion. Um, there seemed to be a fair bit of confusion around the table as we were parsing out portions of the motion. Um, so that is why we're here today. There hasn't been any additional information shared with council staff haven't done any further analysis. This is really just uh, trying to clarify uh, where we're at and give staff um, and the proponent clearer direction than I think what we left with last time. 
Whenever you're ready, Mr. Gunn, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Matt Gunn. I'm a planner with the District of Squamish. I do want to highlight that um, although not in attendance in person, um, we have planned to have two other staff available uh, in case any relevant questions come up. So uh, David Rolston, Manager of Infrastructure, I believe is online, as is Leslie Douglas um, for any there is Leslie right behind me. There we go. So any questions um, related to uh, particularly the 200 meter um, elevation um, topic, that those would go to David and in the site by inventory would go to Leslie. Um, thank you. Uh, so I am here to, uh, as discussed, provide a brief update of what's um, occurred so far in the uh, um, response to a submission for a scope change from the applicant. Uh, as a quick background, um, in response to a number of challenges that had arisen, the North Crumpet landowner and project team submitted a request to Council for a specific direction on several topics. Uh, this was considered at the May 9 Committee of the Whole meeting, where staff provided 10 recommendations in response to these requests for Council direction. Uh, and so th this is just the, as you um, just for your awareness, it was in the um, RTC application package. These are the uh, requests that the applicant had made. We won't go into detail on them, but um, we're responding to those uh, requests. Um, at that May 9th meeting, six motions were carried by council that addressed supporting a phased approach to the land use planning process, consideration of a road between Valley Cliff and Loggers East, designating the Western Rise a future planning area, establishing a maximum unit range, limiting development to below 200 meters, designating an appropriate area of commercial in the planning pro area, ensuring consistency between residential and commercial land uses over time, engaging on ESA and trail preservation to address community expectations that might not be met in a phased approach, and rejecting requests for council resolutions that limited opportunities to ensure trail and ESA limitations. Uh, yeah, in the... I was supposed to click those as we went through, but I didn't. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, so um, those council committee recommendations were discussed again at the May 16th regular council meeting. At the May 16th meeting, five motions were carried by council that addressed the road connection, designating the Western Rise a uh, future planning area, limiting development below 200 meters, designating appropriate areas of commercial, ensuring consistency between residential and commercial um, and engaging on ESA and trail preservation. These were aligned with outcomes of the May 9th, 2023 meeting. Two resolutions um, referring motions to a future committee of the whole um, were passed, which is today. The first is to support a cohesive planning approach. And the second is that council reject requests for any resolution that limits opportunities to ensure preservation of trails and terrestrial and riparian ESA areas on the Western Rise, should those lands not achieve any development rights as part of the current neighborhood planning process. So from a staff perspective, the two questions that um, we're, we're still waiting for direction on are these, the um, based, uh, the, the um, cohesive planning approach for Eastern and Western Rise together, which was discussed at the last meeting, and this motion around um, resolu resolutions that limit opportunities to ensure preservation and trails and ESAs. And that is my presentation. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Gunn, for orienting us to this conversation. Um, so we do have an hour for this discussion. Um, as Mr. Gunn mentioned, we have ratified uh, through the special business meeting a number of the resolutions. I don't necessarily want to reopen debate on things like the 200 meter mark. We can if council feels really necessary to, but those have been voted on. Um, what we're here is to discuss the two motions that were referred to this future committee, the whole discussion, and to try and get clarity, I think mostly on the proposed of this phase or cohesive approach to planning for the, for the entire unit versus severing off the Western Rise. Uh, and this second motion here around rejecting the request for any resolution that limits opportunities to ensure preservation of trails, so on and so forth. So, Council, over to you for questions, clarification that you might need from Mr. Gunn in order to inform your decision going forward. Go ahead, Councillor Pettingill. It, it seems to me that depending on where we land on the first resolution, the second one may not be so relevant. So I'm wondering if it's worth just sort of working through this first one. 
to start. And that's a fair point. They, they are definitely connected. So yeah, any questions that you have or comments that you'd like to make around the table around um, trying to better understand what the risks and opportunities are around a cohesive planning approach versus suffering off the Western rise and the impacts of doing so. Councillor Hamilton, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, through the chair, this is uh, obviously this is a neighborhood planning, a really complex process. Um, and we're talking about very large pieces of land. And so I've tried to figure out what are the cruxes and maybe I'd like to say, explain what I understand to be the crux of the issue and uh, see what if staff agrees that that's the crux of the issue uh, of the issues um, or if if I'm missing something. So it seems to me like, number one, there's a limit to the number of dwelling units that can be um, put into the North Crumpet space in the absence of an additional road connecting uh, Valley Cliff out to Loggers East. Uh, so that's the first issue. Uh, the, and, and in my mind, that's, that's driving many of the difficulties that are arising uh, from in, in this conversation. Um, in the absence of that road, I don't see uh, how North Crumpet would be able to put a uh, substantial number, a, a full neighbor, I would be able to develop the whole space anyways, because of the number of dwelling units that we, that they would be limited to. Um, and so to me, the core uh if, if that road is uncertain then it's unclear to me how they can how the whole thing can be planned together in the absence of a plan for that road so if staff could comment maybe on my my thinking is that road the crux of where this neighborhood planning is going go ahead mr gunn uh, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, through the chair um, that uh, the road, the uh, the constraint on the capacity to access the site um, through the road from the south is uh, one of the key concerns that has led to this discussion around severing. Um, without uh, the additional capacity coming from the north, um, the development potential is uh, the, the ability to develop in the Western Rise um, is is limited, is non-existent. And so the applicant is concerned about the effort uh, and expense required to do that planning when there is uncertainty whether it will be realized. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Hamilton? Yeah, thank you. Um, and because the like that that road connection is outside that developer's control, I completely understand the the hesitancy to plan the whole neighborhood with with a piece that's completely outside their control. So that's where. I under I absolutely understand why the why the proponent has requested a division of the eastern and western rise. Um, I do see the limitations. I, I do think it's better to plan the whole neighborhood all at once. Um, it's just unfortunate we don't have certainty uh, on this road. Is there anything we can do to facilitate certainty on that or progress on the existence of that connecting road? Go ahead, Mr. Gunn. Thank you through the chair. Um, so there, there has been discussion with the applicant about the uh, challenge establishing that road and the, um, the perspective at this time from the dist from district stra staff is that, uh, the cost of, um, pursuing completion of that road is significant enough, uh, it with initial kind of examination that uh, it is not something the district um, sees appropriate to pursue to facilitate a new development 
um, in light of the fact that um, there are very significant um, infrastructure requirements in existing neighborhoods um, that uh, um, need to be addressed in advance of doing um, pursuing uh, construction of a road to a new neighborhood. Um, the DCC program is uh, one potential option that has been discussed around um, a method of getting the funding to um, a take on that project, but uh, from discussion with engineering, our DCC program is uh, heavily subscribed for the foreseeable future. And even using the DCC program, it is unlikely that we would see funds available in um, the foreseeable future to take on that project. Consequently, um, the perspective from staff is that because that road would be uh, necessary to support new development, it should be uh, something taken on as part of that development project. Uh, so I do, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, thank you, it does, uh, to, to a certain extent, because the development of that road is not just a money question. Uh, because there's landowners, it, it, it would affect landowners other than the proponent they are not in control and, and that's where the district would need to um, would need to be involved in having conversations with landowners or right the district has a, would have a role in that road beside um, which is not just financial um, okay so um, my so so thank you very much for your response that that clarifies I have one more question if I have time yeah, go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks. Um, I've asked this question before, and I'm hoping that hoping we can we can somehow we can maybe get to an understanding of it. Um, our housing needs report um, is it, it's been presented many times. Um, do you have uh, any sort of estimate on how many affordable housing units we might be able to acquire in this development from the CAC process? Uh, through you, uh, Chair. Uh, so the, if we were to um, secure uh, affordable housing on this site, it would be through uh, CAC discussions. And um, at this point, there has been no um, specific discussions around CACs that might be offered as part of this neighborhood planning process or as part of future development within this neighborhood. Um, staff has in uh, a previous meeting highlighted some of the um, priorities that uh, staff feel would represent uh, community interests and, um, and uh, interest of those in the neighborhood from what we've heard in the development process or in the application process. Uh, but the applicant hasn't at any point said, um, uh, you know, what we see is this number of units being offered or, you know, other amenities. Um, there was one point where they did highlight a piece of land that might be offered uh, in some discussion, but uh, very limited and no specific unit numbers have been discussed. Thank you for that. On that point, I'm just curious if you can speak a little bit, like we're at a neighborhood planning phase. We aren't at a rezoning and typically CAC discussions happen at rezoning. And so I'm just curious about what our level of expectation is to get that sort of detail from the proponent at this point versus what we've done in the Loggers East plan, for example, is put in policy that the intent is to get to 20% affordable units built out on that particular neighbor in that particular neighborhood in order to support existing policies within the OCP within current council policy. So when do we actually expect to get numbers around CACs? Uh, we absolutely would want to have policy in the neighborhood plan that identifies the intended um, outcome of CACs. Um, and that would likely uh, consider what the mix of CACs that might be of interest. Uh, in, in the report to council, previously we did highlight that um, one, you know, a, a priority might involve some of the land uh, that could become either protected for ESAs or have um, uh, public access, not necessarily getting into 
what the ownership of that land would be, but um, those are things that have come up through the process that we would likely want to um, uh, include in policy that the ESA protection and, and access to um, to land for, for the public. But then in addition, we would like to have policy relevant to affordable housing. And when we have a land use plan that's been identified as the preferred plan, we would have unit numbers and be able to get involved in a discussion around what number of units um, would be uh, highlighted as a goal in the policy. But those would still be up for discussion when actual rezonings were brought forward. Thank you for that. I have Councillor Pettingill, and then I'll put Mayor Herford on the list. Yeah, and I think this has been asked before, but I just want to ask again, and make sure I'm clear. So, um, you know, I understand a road may be an obstacle for development of some of the site, but um, why? What is uh, what's the obstacle to doing a plan for the whole site uh, with an understanding that a road may or may not happen in the future, and and so the plan would need some flexibility to accommodate that. But we sort of have that plan that works in either scenario through the chair um so that was the original intent uh, there was recognition at the outset of the process that um the access from the south would be the primary access and easier to achieve and that at some point in the future access from the north would likely um, become possible and that would unlock additional opportunity for um for development uh over the course, it became clear that the northern access was more challenging. And the challenge, I think, for the applicant um, gets into the, the investigation that is required, the level of investigation detail that is required from staff's perspective to be confident in identifying development nodes and numbers of units that can go in those areas. Um, because the terrain is has significant topography and environmental values, um, it is not an easy uh, parcel to identify development opportunities on. So staff has is staff is reluctant to um, have a plan with nodes and unit numbers identified without confidence that the road network can uh, an appropriate road network can provide access to those units and the servicing is appropriate and clarifying those elements the the access and the servicing will require has is has been a question around um how much investigation and time effort and money is required to clarify those and that is what the um that is one of the risks for the applicant to spend the time and money to clarify those questions and to know that we can adequately service and access those parcels of land so that we can say that these are appropriate for X and Y land uses, that investment is a concern for the applicant with the uncertainty of whether they will be able to actually um, take advantage of those development options. Go ahead, Councillor Peniel. Thanks, so understanding that, is there um, a path where the plan sort of has more detail on the the eastern side um and you know the policy in in whatever plan maybe speaks to those difficulties and the environmental sensitivity and so on so there's less detail but sort of clear policy that maybe the expectations around protecting environmental areas and so on are going to be higher and so when we work through that detail at least that policy framework and expectations are set like is there is that a, a sort of a reasonable middle ground to get us further? Through the chair. Um, yeah, I think that is what we are trying to do with the set of recommendations. One, the, the requests that the applicants have made, this set of, uh, I think it's 11 um, requests for resolutions from council, and then the recommendations from staff are attempting to do that balancing act. We are trying to say, let's identify that there are some um, some uh, development opportunities on the eastern area that can be uh, taken advantage of now with the access. And then let's um, try and identify what needs to be taken care of and considered in the future without doing that investment and identifying the exact nodes and, and road network. So I, I think we're trying to do what you're saying, but Perhaps I'm missing the question if, if I'm off base, but we, I think we are trying to find that middle ground. Okay, thank you. And so, so maybe there is something there. And I guess some of the concern I, you know, I've heard from people is that uh, if we completely separate off and don't think about the western side at all, you know, 
in terms of adequate compensation and protection, like maybe there's more we want to protect in the, the Western side, we're able to do that in consideration of what we're allowing in the Eastern side. And so not losing those opportunities, is that something that is still possible in this, this sort of um, balanced framework? That is a very good question. And that is what the, the nature of that final point in the list of recommendations. Um, the applicant's perspective, as stated to staff, is that um, if the property is divided into the two sections to the east and the western rise, then any discussion around protection of um, environmental values or public access trails on the access to those in the western rise should be a separate conversation and should be only addressed at a time when those um, properties in the western area are considered for development. From the perspective of staff, um, the uh, public has highlighted how important ESAs and access to the trail network, network are throughout the process. And um, staff believe that there is a expectation from the community that those values be considered in the planning process and that, um, and there, there is no specific reason that um, the applicant's request to fully separate that consideration into a f uh, future discussion. Um, there's no, no need for that to be the case. Um, uh, it would not be unreasonable to have a discussion around um, those values that are considered important to the community as part of this process. Mayor Herford, go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm with this phase, the phased approach. Um, I think the phasing that future planning um, sort of um, wording is is interesting. Just how, and I think might mean different things to different people because knowledge has. Uh, knowledge has been accumulated throughout this this process um already as much as there's a um you know outstanding questions so how do we capture the in a phased plan or a version of a phase plan how do we capture the work that's already been been done and ensure that that um and communicate that out to the to the community around the identified areas um environmentally sensitive areas um, to the level that they're identified currently or about to be as there's some out, outstanding questions that are um, going to become answered questions hopefully shortly. So how do we capture that piece of work so that um, we can communicate it out and that it doesn't need to be replicated in some other few potentially replicated in another future process? To the chair. Um, so that that is a good question. Uh, we we do not want to lose the that valuable work and information that's um, been gathered. Uh, so the, the intention is to um, incorporate all of the mapping work, which is the primary um, reflection of that work, in the um, plan for the entire parcel. Um, so there, for example, the environmental work that's being completed as part of the site by inventory, all of the mapping would be included, even though um, in the approach that's being proposed, we would only be looking at land uses on the eastern portion of the property. So we would bring forward that technical information in the plan. So as that relates to specific motions, um, the first motion is around that severing and making it a phased approach. What I've just heard there is that there's work that's happened sort of broadly across the landscape that um, will be included in the outcome. So. I don't think that wording quite aligns with expectations. So I'm thinking a lower level of detail on the West or, or a plan that would, that would allow for a low, lower level of detail in the West at this point and some trigger for that future and layout sort of that path forward for, um, you know, when the access issues, if the access issues ever get, get resolved or when the access issues get resolved, then it triggers this, deep this deeper layer and to me it's um not necessarily a future planning area that's planned it just has you know it acknowledges the the out the outstanding pieces so that that full level of planning that may not be appropriate to do at this time and may not be appropriate to do ever if that access issue isn't solved is is accounted for in there and it's still planning for the for the whole is that 
is that adding too many variables and what ifs and triggers to, to what we're trying to do here? Um, and is that, was that what I'm hearing? To the chair, I have a question and then a comment. Um, and in, in that, uh, less detailed level of information that you're speaking to on the Western rise, are you contemplating development nodes identified with land uses? Because that is the key question from planning staff. And I, I just want to understand your question. Are you thinking about having nodes identified? Well, I suppose um, defining where the um, the level of detail to go to. So is it stopping shorts of nodes or and what is it that lift to get to identified nodes? That's the that's the crux. So I, I'm not I'm not clear exactly where where that is. I I understand that going to the the nodes level requires that road that road work, and I can see some other planning pieces and that being. So is there a threshold below that that's worth that could still have value, or is it really, or in your opinion, is it is it really best to fully sever it and set it set it aside and not get into those triggers and when that other work would need to be accomplished and those types of things. Through the chair, um, from the staff perspective, it's the identification of of land use nodes and the um, yeah the land uses in those nodes that are a really key component. Once that becomes part of the OCP, it does create um, an expectation, um, which in a, for a future council at a future time may. Um, be harder to uh, to choose an outcome other than we have to find a way to allow those uses in those lands, um, regardless of whether the servicing or road network can be completed within our regulations and policies. Um, it creates a, the concern of SAS is that it establishes an expe expected outcome. So staff are very reluctant to go to that level. That is the key point. Um, we, we want to make sure that the road, that the road network and the servicing can be done in an appropriate manner before we say, yes, those land uses are appropriate in those locations. So below that, which is the technical background information, which is being worked on, happy to have that included in the neighborhood plan, establishing the nodes. That's where there is um, a level of detail that we really want to be confident in, which does take the investment. I wonder if that motion that we're work that we're discussing can better reflect that because it doesn't um, sort of identifying where that line is and the amount of work to me severing it as a future planning area really sounds very very much like we're setting aside the work that's that's been done and the engagement that's happened with the community in that in that area and um, we'll deal with that in the future versus something that is uh, a threshold that's below the um, identifying the nodes, but accounting for all that work that that has happened. And I think that might be one of the drivers for the tension that um, in in the group here around what what it is and, and what it isn't. So I'm going to reflect on that and see if I can help with uh, a motion that better captures that. But um, yeah, anyways, thank you. I'll put myself on the list and then if anybody else, otherwise I'll go back to Councillor Pettingill. Um, thanks for the further discussion and clarification of some of these points. Um, I definitely hear that staff have a, are reluctant to, to identify the nodes and the number of units. I was wondering if you can elaborate on like, so where, what is the level of information that we need to be able to effectively do that? So I'm thinking of like the waterfront and I appreciate that there are some unique characteristics to this land, but I think of like the waterfront sub area plan, the oceanfront sub area plan, they have high level percentages. Is that kind of the challenge that we're having is identifying like the, per like the percentage of the land that could be used for different uses? Is that the information that we need to make that alignment for percentages? Is that where the challenge is in terms of having the accurate information to be able to do that? Um, I just want to see, is Sarah Bailey, I did talk to Sarah. Yeah. I'll bring so Sarah Bailey up. I might ask Sarah to join me. I'll take a stab at it first and then maybe ask if Sarah um, can speak the following. Um, but uh, the in, in a landscape that has the topography that this landscape has, um, the road network becomes a really defining factor in where um, 
service where development can occur and um going through that process uh, and identifying that road network is very important to being confident in the ultimate land use plan the applicant as part of their proposal in their initial neighborhood plan proposal did um, uh, offer to help the district develop some hillside road standards, which we don't currently have and which would be a beneficial part of this process for the district. Um, and they are now, uh, they've made a proposal to the district about how that process would work. Uh, and we are we are receptive to that and are um, interested in engaging on that um, project, which would help us more broadly, but also help define that road network and where those um, nodes could be. So we're certainly um, interested in that, uh, but it is a really key part to I understand that road network to know, it's it's really the location of the nodes and the size and extent of those nodes that, that we need that certainty on the road network. And um, servicing as well, we need to know that if we're going to say, these parcels of land can be developed for these um, uses at this level of density that the infrastructure can be built in accordance with our regulatory framework that that is those are key questions that need to be addressed and there is work that needs to be done to identify that i might pass it to you if you want to speak to that hello through the chair uh, i'm sarah bailey director of engineering yeah matt's articulated that quite well the road network is the basis for hillside development to determine how you access these properties and having the density numbers is what determines your servicing requirements. So you need a density to see what you need for water, sanitary, um, and obviously your, your size to help with your storm. So the road network is the key piece. And as Matt said, the applicants offered to help work through hillside standards with us, which will be a comprehensive process with the applicant and internal for us to have those fulsome discussions as a municipality, what we want for hillside road standards. Um, and it's a very important part of that process to have that criteria laid out at the start. And once we develop those standards, then we know the steepness of roads and you know where you can access and that's where you can build. Maybe just as a follow up on a, a flat parcel of land, there's more opportunity to be less specific. Um, so in other areas where you might do a neighborhood plan for a, for a less complicated piece of land, you could do um, less detailed work. But because we want certainty that those parcels can be accessed and serviced properly, and we don't want to be in a position where we have said we'll, um, we're you know supportive of these land uses here, and then we have to make compromises on our servicing access, we, we, we are very reluctant to do it without the knowledge. Thank you for that clarification. That's helpful. Uh, Councillor Pettengill, back to you. Thanks. Uh, so one question. Uh, originally, I, I think this was meant to be a sub area plan. We're calling it now a neighborhood plan. Is there a technical difference or it's the same thing? Um, so in the OCP, we use the term sub area plan for all of the um, reference to this type of planning process. Uh, at some point along the way, um, sub area plan was considered not a very user friendly or publicly approachable name. And so we've started using neighborhood plan for the exact same process. Okay, thanks. And so just on, uh, just trying to understand the granularity we need on some or all of the site. And I guess in my mind, when I've listened to the conversation and some of the evolving policy and recommendations and work around um, contiguous uh, green space for large animals and so on, you know, I guess I'm re hesitant east or west side to have what nodes conjures in my mind where there's you know, a wide network spread all over the place in little cul-de-sacs with three or four homes that are maybe technically developable, but you need to really fragment the site to achieve that. In my mind, uh, again, east or west, I'm looking for the two spots maybe per side or whatever, that, that's, that's where the development goes and you're not fragmenting it, you're not doing cul-de-sacs, it's very, you know, walkable friendly, transit friendly, close to existing development, all that sort of stuff. And so if we're focused on that as our starting point, does that allow us to sort of rule in or out sort of large areas and then we don't have to do as much detailed work on some of those things? Because when I saw some of the preliminary maps, it does look like you're having to deal with a very fragmented 
you know, like small roads and small cul-de-sacs all over the place, if that sort of as a starter is not what we want, does that sort of help us get to something more achievable for the site? Through the chair, this is a good question. Um, I think I'll, I'll just step back for a minute. Um, this property was rezoned from RS1 to RM5 uh, some time ago. And in that process, um, OCP policy was established relevant to the potential future development of the land. And that OCP policy sa uh, said something to the effect, I'm, you know, off the top of my head, I'm, I won't have it exactly right, but something to the effect that um, you know, a significant increase in density would be considered um, in the uh, event that it was for a walkable um, neighborhood or community with access to services, something along those lines. So that we have OCP policy that's um, considerate of this increase in density that's proposed for a walkable community. Um, and in discussion with the applicant, the um, long uh, extending roads to developments has been highlighted as something that may not be aligned with that. As part of the process of assessing that, um, staff have developed uh, a um, index or a, some, a, a way to um, evaluate walkability, which um, this has been something developed by our sustainability team that we could apply to um, development proposals over time across the community. So it's the first um, time we've we've created and tried to use this and we have provided it to the applicant as something to uh, try to assess the walkability of the neighborhood. Um, but with all of the complications in the process and you know that have led to this discussion around the severing, the, we haven't had follow up from the team about that, about how that um, their development proposal um, is assessed against that walkability. But I do think that is um, another significant policy question about the proposed development. Uh, and we haven't gone down the road of that discussion because there have been these more primary uh, questions around is this project going to be severed or not. But it's a, it's a very relevant question and OCP policy does um, indicate that it should be a walkable neighborhood if we're going to increase the density in the long stretches may not be considered walkable. So, so just to follow up then, if we were to, I mean, it sounds like we've already got the policy. I don't know if we need to confirm it or underscore it or if, and if we got to that place, would that make the splitting discussion moot because there would only be sort of with what we have, we know there's only a one or two sort of larger developable sites that make it walkable and so on and, and therefore the splitting is isn't so much you know we can more adequately um phase it at a less detailed level and if this all makes sense then we can just kind of go through the chair i uh, no, i believe it's a more nuanced than that for a couple of reasons uh one um the uh, well, maybe the most important piece is that uh, where the line has been drawn for the um, the, the distinction between the eastern and western halves, um, there is still um, development lands on the western rise that are quite close to what would be a commercial and and um, uh, neighborhood node hub in the eastern area. So even if, um, you know, there was a decision um, or direction from council to only support, you know, development within a certain radius of, of a commercial node, there is still land on the western rise that may well fall within that area. And um, it, it's quite likely that, you know, that the reason that that may be is that given the road capacity of around 350 to 450, I'm not 100% clear, but somewhere around there from the southern access, um, only a portion of what could be developed in the eastern area close to the um, neighborhood node is possible at this time. So there's, if a road to the north was developed, there is more development that could be um, uh, possible even on the western access, western rise that could be quite close to the node. Does that answer that question? I think so, but if that is the sort of constraint, if that is the way we wish to go in our policy, uh, is that a sufficient enough direction that 
it's no longer onerous to sort of plan out the east and west side and understand it would be phased in terms of construction or build out and dependent on the road. But, you know, we're not having to plan out in the neighborhood plan nodes spread out all over the whole thing. It's, it's, it's a much more sort of understandable area. And then the cohesive plan makes sense. Through the chair. Um, so the applicant has brought forward an application that does, um, I think, attempt to utilize all of the development opportunity, which includes roads that are longer and go to more distant locations. And um, if the applicant were to change their their approach and say, hey, we, we just want to do this location that's close to the node, then that might be um, a possibility along the lines of what you're saying. But the applicant does have the right to bring forward the application that they're interested in, and that is and the application they brought in does have longer roads to the different areas of the property. And so staff have to work with that application and respond to that. Thank you very much. Uh, it is, we have 15 minutes left in this discussion. Just so folks know, I would like to try and get us towards a motion. I have Councillor Hamilton and then Mayor Herford, uh, and then we'll entertain a motion if somebody has something they might want to put on the table. Go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks very much uh, through the chair. One simple question. I'm sure it's in the document somewhere. Um, but are there any uh, development questions or opportunities above 200 meters in the central and eastern area? Uh, through the chair, I believe not. I believe they're all on the western rise. I'm pretty sure about that. Actually, I have a map here. Two seconds. I'm just going to turn around. Yeah, the, the answer is no. Okay, so the reason I asked that question is that the, the, the proponent's questions about 200 meters become moot uh, in the short term if we go with a phased plan. Um, the second question I have is the, um, you said that one of the disadvantages of going to a phased plan is that you wanted to make sure that you had utilities an infrastructure built uh, sufficiently uh, large to accommodate whatever might happen in the Western Rise. Is it possible to just insist that that infrastructure is, you know, I, I assume this is sort of the, the diameter of water pipes, the diameter of sewer pipes, that kind of thing. Just insist that those things are all as big as they might ever need to be um, for whatever might happen in the Western Rise. Um, as opposed to slowing the whole process so that we can get it right, just oversize it. That doesn't seem like a big development cost, but maybe I'm misunderstanding. Go ahead, Mr. Gunn. Through the chair. Um, I, I do want to uh, clarify, I may not have um, articulated accurately. Um, the, the crux is to make sure that in the Western Rise, there is the possibility when developed for um, the road and it, uh, servicing infrastructure to be built in accordance with our um, regulations and policies. Um, it, uh, the size certainly can be accommodated. It's more, is it is there, um, given the terrain, ESAs and steepness, can we actually do the network in accordance with our regulations? So and the size wasn't as much of the issue that always can be accommodated later. It's more, is there the possibility physically to reach the locations that are proposed um, in alignment with our regulations and policies. I'll pass it over to Sarah, who had a point she wanted to make. To the chair, I just wanted to comment on the oversizing of infrastructure. It's not um, something we, we prefer to do. There's risks in having your infrastructure oversized. Um, you have to keep an eye on it. It's increased maintenance potentially. Um, so when sizing infrastructure, you do want to have a really good idea on the density you're proposing. Um, similarly, you don't want to put it in and have to come back and size it later. So estimations would, would have to be made. Um, but I would have concerns about being left with oversized infrastructure that wasn't required. And just to reflect what I think I've heard from staff, one of the, the Bigger challenges is the road network and the road infrastructure 
and if we can actually create the roads at a steepness that is acceptable based on the set environmentally sensitive areas that are around. So like how those roads would be moved, like would move through that terrain without being super steep, um, given the constraints, the environmentally sensitive areas and a few others on this particular piece of land. But the road infrastructure seems to be the crux, not necessarily the stuff that we'd put underground. Is that correct? Thank you to the chair. Yes, I would agree with that statement. Thank you. I'll go to Mayor Herford. Sorry. Thank you. Um, one question on this Western Rise piece, then I would like to talk about the other motion when I think these two pieces, um, you know, are, are inter intertwined. So we spent a lot of time on the one piece, but I want to make sure that we cover the, the other piece. Um, you said that the, there's areas in the Western Rise that could be considered um, walkable and so on and could be developed that way, um, which lead, led me to the question around the the mapping here and what is considered the Western Rise versus what's considered the Central Valley Eastern Slopes and that at sort of active planning area um, potentially. And is my question would be is is staff comfortable with the uh, mapping as 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 proposed or you know as we're talking about things that that things that could move here could those potentially developable areas um, be included in the planning area and, you know, change the shape of that Western rise um, to account to account for that. I, uh, um, can I ask the staff to help I uh, get the presentation, the map up on the screen? Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, so um, in, in an earlier meeting of, with council staff highlighted that they were, um, and it was one of the recommendations, I don't think it was um, uh, adopted by council, but staff did uh, recommend that um, in general, staff was supportive of the um, Central Valley and Eastern Slopes, I think they're called. Um, wait, I'll just flip through the, I've got a map here. Uh, and so um, the proposal as uh, made for this separation or the phased approach um, does pro um, propose development that staff is generally supportive of. Um, I think your question is, are there areas of the Western Rise that might be worth including in this? But I would say that um, this, is, this is not inappropriate because this area here could support I think the applicant said 900, up to 900 units, and there's only about 300 to 450 units of, that could be possible with the road network from the south. So there's, um, given the current access, there is significant uh, opportunity to accommodate that amount of development in a walkable um, style in, in, in what is proposed. So staff are comfortable with the mapping that is proposed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then can we go to the second the second motion that we haven't discussed yet? And could you run us through that that and the intent of that of that motion? Absolutely. Um, I I would probably be easiest if I just reiterated what I um, spoke to in the first meeting. So just a second, I have that slide here. So um, the the applicant has requested that um, the council resolve that if the Western Rise lands do not achieve development rights, that ESAs and trails are not required to be dedicated to the district. And to be clear, through a neighborhood planning process, the applicant would not be required to dedicate land to the district as a public park or open space. In, in effect, the, the request by the applicant, th there is no um, situation in which we would require that um, the applicant dedicate land to the district. But in reviewing this request, council should keep several points in mind. When considering voluntary CACs, which are not requirements, it is appropriate for council to utilize an approach that aligns with our OCP policies and community's expectations. The OCP stipulates that neighborhood plans should inventory ESAs and trails for protection, for protection. Previous engagement demonstrates broad public support for the preservation of ESAs and trails on North Crumpet. Therefore, it is appropriate to consider these values as part of the planning process. 
Engagement activities led by the applicant have consistently presented information to the public regarding protection of ESAs and public access to trails. The change in scope proposed by the applicant represents a significant deviation from the proposal presented to the public. The proposed change in scope has the potential to negatively impact the district's ability to meet public expectations for ESA protection and secured public access to trails as described during the engagement by the applicant. So consideration should be given to a planning approach that will successfully meet public expectations within a phased planning approach. That is where that original recommendation came from. But as staff, I have note that council has concerns or has there have been concerns highlighted about this. And I would say, you know, an alternate staff recommendation to this particular item would be to make no response to the request from st from the applicant on this topic. Um, there is, we're not obligated to as a council. Go ahead, Mayor Hufford. Okay, so with this in mind, can you bring up the motion that we, this isn't the, this is the request. This was the motion that was presented by staff as a response. So in the, um, in the, the alternate, well, I'm having a hard time where this, the, they just seem a little disjointed. And I think that, um, and, and the first, the, re the requests make sense. And I see that this is sort of the, but if there's no resolution on this topic and a proposal comes forward during the neighborhood planning, during the rest of this process, it would come to council for, for consideration. Uh, yeah, as, as stated, the, the applicant has made no um, rec uh, suggestion on what an amenity package might include. Um, but if they did, certainly that's something that would be discussed with council at that point. There would be discussion and negotiation at a staff level with the applicant, and then that would be something that would be considered by council at a, at a later point. Okay, thank you. I think, um, yeah, the, the, ask, the ask here and the, um, and the, um, the resolution, I just, I think that the, that this is a piece that that we need to I'd be happy to leave this to to a specific ask when when we get there and if there needs to be this last bit of of direction provide provided that's that's um, that could be okay with if we end up severing that that western piece then we'll look at we can look at it at, at that point but um, okay thank you for that these that gives me the clarity I was looking for um, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to clarify something that I heard from you earlier, Mr. Gunn, that the intent here is kind of find a middle ground. So um, if we do decide to se sever off the Western Rise of the future planning area, there's still the opportunity to put policy language into the neighborhood plan that would speak to the long-term values that we're trying to seek out of that region or that part of the parcel, but not necessarily identify specific neighborhood nodes. Is that correct? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think that it would be an important component to include in the plan as policy that could guide whatever came later around um, the uh, future development of those lands should the road be constructed. Okay, so I have uh, a proposed motion. I'm going to go to Councillor Pettingill first, uh, and then I'm going to put something on the floor and we can tear it apart and build it back up. Okay, so I just want to clarify the uh, because I heard mention a couple times of, of the word severing again, were we to do that, would we be precluded in, in, I guess then that would prevent us, or would it in terms of CACs when developments happened, when rezonings and development happened on the Eastern side from asking as part of CACs consideration for ESAs or trail protection in the Western side, like that would still be on the table? <laughs> Uh, yes, there there would be uh, opportunity to discuss CACs in any capacity or any any um, configuration, uh, regardless of whether development was being planned on the western side or not. The applicant has indicated that they do not want that, but it is not. Um, there isn't anything that uh, constrains that discussion. Okay, I am going to put something on the floor for consideration that may be 
a little bit challenging just in terms of some of the language, but here we go. Um, and I can send this to you after Melissa. That council supports a comprehensive approach, the North Crumpet Neighborhood Plan that designates the area of the Western Rise as a future planning area, but includes high level policies that speak to complete, compact, walkable communities, affordable housing, protection of ESAs, values of trails and community and, uh, and securing public access, as well as other policies relevant from OCP. Are you seconding that? Seconded by Councillor Pettingill. Uh, I will speak to it because I made the motion and then I'll go to you, Councillor Hamilton, unless you have a, a clarifying question. Could you just uh, repeat the motion? I'd be happy to repeat it. Thanks. So the, my motion is that council supports a comprehensive approach to the North Crumpet Neighborhood Plan that designates the area of the Western Rise as a future planning area, but includes high level policies that speak to complete compact walkable communities, B, affordable housing, three, protection of ESAs, four, value of trails and public access, five, other relevant policies from the OCP. Yes, go ahead, Council Hamilton. And a question for clarity, when you say a comprehensive plan um, and we include uh, policy language and policy direction, you're not requesting the um, full and detailed uh, where the nodes are located. Um, Correct. I am so suggesting that we do the detailed analysis of the Western Rise as a future planning area, but we're including a high level policy that would direct future planning of that area with the expectation that would come from our comprehensive planning network for that particular parcel of land. Thank you. You're welcome. So speaking of this, um, I really appreciate uh, staff uh, coming back with this discussion and, and the questions that have come from my council colleagues. I think it's been important to seek clarity around this table um, so that we are all on the same page with what's going forward um, so that we can give staff clear direction as well as the proponent. Um, it's been really helpful for me to really just think through the details of what this would actually mean um, with respect to our ambitions through neighborhood planning and really understanding the broad concepts of what we're trying to achieve through policies and neighborhood plans um, and balancing that with the realities of the challenges of this parcel. Um, and I think one of the risks that we always have is, is wanting to get more information and detail in order to make sure that we are doing our due diligence and making sure that we have dotted all our I's and cross all our T's. Um, but this is still a high level neighborhood plan and we are not at rezoning. We are not trying to secure CACs through this process. Um, so I think it's important to take a little bit of a step back and re-elevate that conversation of where we're at in the neighborhood planning process. Um, but also appreciating that tension of what we do in neighborhood planning typically is identify areas where there are development potentials and identify land uses, but that's going to be really challenging for the rust and rise. And so that's where this conversation has really helped me become more comfortable with that approach where we are taking, um, a, a, a stepwise or a, a phased approach to that Western rise component, but it'll still hopefully give, uh, council and staff and the proponent and in particular, our community, um, some comfort that through policy we'll be able to identify what the continued values are of that neighborhood plan in the long term. Again, going back to that OCP kind of visioning level, what is this neighborhood going to look like in 20, 30, or 40 years? Um, I think that's the important policy to capture for the Western Rise within this plan. I don't want to lose that, but I'm okay not going down to the level of detail in terms of neighborhood node planning um, given the constraints on this particular parcel. And so that's why I put this motion forward. I'm happy to hear from others if they would like to speak to it. I'll go to Mayor Herford and then around the table back to group Greenlaw and we'll put you on the list, Han Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. I think, um, thank you for the, the motion, um, Councillor Stoner. I think this um, captures what some read as the intent of the original, of the original motion, but provides the uh, additional clarity. So I'm happy to 
um, to support and uh, appreciate our discussion here today, as I do believe this topic um, deserve the uh, additional uh, time and attention it's it's received here today. So thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Greenlaw. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, I'll speak in favor of this motion. I do. Th I think this motion provides balance. I do think it is unfair and unrealistic to expect the proponents to plan the western rise to the same extent as the currently developable portions of the property. But for my part, my concerns were lying largely in the ability to have a cohesive neighborhood plan, assurances that we maximize contributions to the community, and prioritization of the preservation of ecosystem connectivity. And I think this motion ensures that we still have a lot of decision-making power in those capacities. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Greenlaw. I'll go to Councillor Anderson. Thank you. I'll speak in favor of the motion. I did, however, hear, uh, I just wanted, I'm, I'm assuming that staff is clear on um, Acting Mayor Stoner on your reference to detailed analysis. I th thought I heard it being mentioned in two different uh, respects, but I understand that we're after a practical approach with respect to detailed analysis. I wanted to also comment on, as I did last time, on our expectations uh, coming from public input. We do not handle public input consistently. And I'm concerned that we should be mindful of consistency as we approach expectations from applicants in a planning process like this. What about the next time? What about the last time? What, I, what guides me is the need to be reasonable and practical, and I hope that this motion before us uh, satisfies that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I'll go to Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, thanks. Uh, speaking also in favor of the, uh, the motion, um, I think it does make sense to consider this whole area together, but it also, you know, there are realistic constraints in terms of the road and, and the impacts of that. Um, so going with some less detail, on the western side makes sense. I think developing some of that higher level policy, maybe sooner rather than later, will be helpful to the public and the proponent. I'm not sure we're all on the same page and some of those higher level policy pieces might help shape this uh, quite well. And I uh, just assume that that's part of this work and the ongoing discussion and that will become clear and maybe will negate some of the current concerns. Uh, at least that's my hope. So happy to move forward on this basis. And um, you know, maybe it's worth having a touch point on some of those higher level policy expectations. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor French, then Councillor Hamilton. Uh, thanks, Councillor Stoner. Uh, and, and thanks for this motion. Thanks for the wording. I think that um, it very effectively captures uh, a, a direction uh, that I'd like us to see uh, go forward. And uh, thus, I'm speaking in favor of the motion. And, and I heard a phrase that really re resonates with me in this conversation, realities of challenges with this parcel. And that's, that's certainly very true. There are significant challenges with this parcel of land. And uh, as we explore developing other parcels in our community that are similar to this plot of land, we're going to bump up against the very same challenges we're seeing now. Uh, I think that this motion um, sets us up with uh, realistic community expectations and strikes a delicate balance between what uh, the developer is going to require to deliver a viable project and what the community is expecting out of this property. Thank you. We'll go to Councillor Hamilton. Thanks very much. I'll be speaking in support of this motion. I think it does um, a very good job of balancing the, as Councillor French and, and uh, Acting Mayor Stoner pointed out, the, the challenging pieces of this parcel. I think that one of the, um, the, the road is a very challenging question. Um, I personally uh, believe I, I would like to see that road um, put in. I think it's going to be a significant improvement to the connectivity of our of our town, particularly the residents of Valley Cliff and their connectivity to our recreation center. Uh, the number of parents that probably drive all the way around through the highway to Brennan Park two or three times or four times a day um, is probably significant. And I think uh, connector road there uh, would be a very valuable contribution to the residents of, of Valley Cliff and to our transportation network. So I'll speak in support of this motion in hopes that uh, we will get one step closer to connecting our community. Thanks. 
Thank you for your comments. I'll call the question. Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you to staff. Thank you to council. And we'll take a 10 minute recess and come back at 1120. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back. We are in the Committee of the Whole for the District of Squamish, and we are on item 3.3, Community Planning Workshop 101, Rezoning and Development Permits. And we have Ms. Fletcher and Mr. Daly here. I will pass it over to you. This is gonna be a workshop style, so uh, staff are gonna give a presentation, but I believe we'll do questions as we go. So if you do have a question, just catch my attention uh, and I'll put you on the speakers list. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Council and Chair. Uh, my name is Jesse Fletcher, Planner with Community Planning, and with me is Brian Daly, Planner with Community Planning. Uh, we'll be running through a workshop on uh, rezoning and development permits on behalf of uh, the Senior Director who's out with a cold today. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so today our workshop will go through the legislation, um, a bit of background on exclusionary and inclusionary zoning, uh, the rezoning and the development permit processes, and we'll do a little bit of background on temporary use permits. Uh, so before we dive into the rezoning process, uh, we'll talk about why we receive so many rezoning applications and why most development applications that are not uh, for a single unit or a duplex dwelling need to go through a rezoning process. So a bit of the legislative context uh, and some background on zoning. So for authority for comprehensive zoning in British Columbia has been in place for about 100 years. Uh, modern community planning and zoning evolved from the Industrial Revolution where residential and industrial uses evolved side by side, which created some uh, dirty environments for people that were living in, so air pollution, et cetera. And that drove the need to uh, use zoning and community planning as a tool to separate uh, incompatible uses. Uh, zoning powers were originally brought in to provide land use uniformity by segregating uses to different areas. So land was zoned for residential, commercial, industrial, and institutional uses, uh, and zoning assigned different densities, limiting the type of housing that could be built in an area. Uh, this is reflected in the highlighted portion of the screen. I think there's an animation. Uh, why don't you hit that one? There we go. Thank you. Um, where you can see the Local Government Act, uh, dis which describes municipal authorities to regulate land uses through zoning. So we can regulate the use of land, buildings, and other structures, uh, their siting sizes and dimensions, uh, as well as the density of the use of land. Uh, this legislative system broadly facilitates what is referred to as exclusionary zoning, uh, meaning zoning can exclude uses from an area, leaving only a few in residential or commercial areas. Uh, zoning can exclude certain forms of housing that are deemed undesirable in a particular neighborhood uh, through density controls. And as a result, zoning excludes certain income groups. There is a body of research that shows that exclusionary zoning can support artificially higher housing prices. Uh, we don't have to look very far in our own community to find enduring examples of exclusionary zoning, uh, where predominant zoning is residential with some accessory uses and very limited choices for different housing typologies. Uh, to this day, zoning is a restrictive tool that mainly provides an ability to put restrictions and conditions on how land and buildings are used. The tool can be used in a positive way to eliminate or restrict uses that society has deemed as problematic. Uh, for example, our zoning bylaw restricts, um, but for the most part, sorry, we are still using the system for what it was designed to, to exclude. Um, so a good example of this would be uh, we zone uh, tobacco retailers to certain areas to restrict where they are. Another interesting and not surprising attitude is that for a long time, uh, land use uniformity was a zoning principle uh, and spot zoning one piece of land within a uniformly zoned area was considered an unsavory practice. Um, and there was a public meeting years ago where an older gentleman stood up to speak against the proliferation of comprehensive development zones in our zoning bylaw. Um, <laughs> And it's referred to uh, in these notes that I did not write that it was a blast from the past in terms of planning philosophies. Uh, today, we accept spot zoning and comprehensive development zones um, as good practice of infusing diversity into what were generally uniform land use areas. 
So in order to tackle a century of exclusionary zoning, we need to put things back into our neighborhoods. Um, the supply has been constrained for a very long time uh, by constraining the type of housing that is built and where it's built. Abolishing the system has its challenges. One of them is that the suppliers have adapted to the system. If we say you can put any type of housing anywhere, so long as there's infrastructure and services there, then the most lucrative forms of housing will be built and it will happen at the expense of things like employment land use. This is where inclusionary zoning comes in. Uh, generally, this term refers to adding affordable housing into zones, uh, either as a requirement or as a voluntary density bonus. Uh, but it also refers to reducing exclusions in general and reducing barriers for uses that the neighborhood needs, uh, thereby increasing the flexibility of zoning. Uh, this is what we now try to do through the rezoning process spot by spot, but too often we spend a lot of time trying to manage the development outcomes to make sure that we don't upset the imbalance in a particular neighborhood established by the exclusionary system. Uh, so if we really want to change our zoning system, we need to expand the uses in our neighborhoods, relax overarching regulations such as setbacks, height, parking, and give up some of our desire to exclude different forms of housing. Some of that can be done through the rezoning process, but that process is slow, uh, one property at a time, too slow to affect systemic change of exclusionary zoning. We need to do, we need, oh, I'm sorry, I am getting very old and I can't see. <laughs> if we wanted to achieve meaningful progress through inclusion, what we need to do is revisit our flagship neighborhood zone. So the RS1, RS2, RM1, RM2, and RM3 zones. Uh, perhaps all is needed is a single zone, a neighborhood zone that is inclusionary and accounts for all the services and a variety of housing forms in 10 years. Uh, a neighborhood might need to make it a great place to live, work, and play for everyone, which would align our neighborhoods more closely with the vision that's set out in the official community plan. Uh, on the screen are some examples of small neighborhood commercial in residential neighborhoods uh, in Vancouver specifically. Um, but this is sort of the, the vision of inclusionary zoning where you can see a variety of uses in residential neighborhoods and a variety of housing forms. Uh, so we're gonna have a pause there and we'll take some questions. Go ahead, Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, thanks. So just um, trying to pull together a few of the concepts. So does inclusionary zoning imply that we would replace RS1 with something that would allow small commercial or apartments or single family or like any kind of thing. And so this whole huge region, then anyone to develop wanting to develop anywhere would have any of these options. Or are we thinking more that through neighborhood plan, we'd sort of outline the mix, but then we'd spot done with CDs of sort of specific per lot uses. So in aggregate, we'd end up with a mix, but we're still very much controlling particular lots. Uh, through the chair, that's a great question. Um, inclusionary zoning conceptually, it's just meaning that there would be more flexibility built into land uses. If you look at some of our uh, more historic neighborhoods like Denville, you'll see a different like range of housing forms. So there are ground level apartments and duplexes and triplexes and townhouses. You see the same thing in uh, some parts of Valley Cliff where they're not actually zoned for a duplex, but there is a historic duplex there. Uh, so the idea with inclusionary zoning is there would be some flexibility somewhere to to build different unit mixes or perhaps some commercial that was appropriate for the neighborhood given servicing constraints and other factors like that. Um, the the concept of inclusionary zoning doesn't necessarily take away neighborhood planning or CD zoning. Um, it speaks more to being more flexible and allowing the vision of the OCP to be achieved through through some flexibility in zoning as opposed to uh, rigid zoning right now that would require any commercial activity beyond a home-based business in an RS1 zone neighborhood, for example, to go for CD zoning, which would be costly and prohibitive and time consuming. Go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks very much. Um, uh, spot zoning, the, the move from going from exclusionary zoning um, into spot zoning. Can you talk, speak to some of the advantages of spot zoning? I'm trying to imagine um, why it's good. What are the advantages of spot zoning? 
Uh, through the chair, so spot zoning is typically what we see now when uh, somebody comes forward for a comprehensive development zone. Um, it is it advantageous in that it does allow for some more site specific negotiations. If you're looking for example, a, a land lift uh, that goes beyond what was envisioned um, in the original zoning. Um, so it does it does allow a bit more flexibility there, but there is there is the time process to that. Um, it, it is a time consuming process and there are expenses which does sometimes make smaller projects more prohibitive. The only thing I would add to that is spot zoning uh, has its advantages as well. If there's environmentally sensitive areas on site or steep slopes or something like that, where you really need to get very specific about setbacks and things like that. Um, so you can fully achieve the development uh, that they don't always fit kind of into one general box. If you apply to zone broadly. Thank you. Any other questions at this point council? We pass back to staff to keep going. Thank you. Uh, and so now let's discuss the rezoning process. Uh, any property owner can apply to rezone their property. Uh, most of our neighborhood zoning is not well aligned with the OCP and we want people to apply to rezone their property uh, to bring it more in alignment with the official community plan. Uh, but in reality, most applicants do dread the rezoning process. There is a lot of uncertainty related with it. Uh, and it means that they will almost certainly be required to meet a higher standard than everyone else who isn't going through a rezoning process. And it might take a very long time to get there. Uh, the task for us is to make the rezoning process more predictable, fast, painless, and consistent. Getting specific on aspects that are not important to overall community objectives is problematic. Specific development layout is, for example, not a job of the rezoning, but for the development permit. Uh, municipal government uh, needs to be careful with uh, asks of development. Uh, these should be based in policy and realistic. Applicants are sometimes willing to commit to things that may result in a failing of the project, uh, or it could be someone who is going to resell the land once the land is rezoned. Uh, so uh, let's take a look at it as an example of a district led rezoning. Um, so the mud one zoning approach was applied at the north end of the, the business park. Again, it was district led and it rezoned this area from RS2 to mud one. Working with the landowners, staff identified a broad range of commercial and industrial uses, uh, more industrial to the south adjacent to the existing business park and more commercial to the north uh, closer to the residential area. It also allowed for a st substantial amount of residential and built in a density bonus for market rental and a density bonus for activating open space. The objective was to establish better alignment with the OCP. Uh, four of the five properties in this area either have been developed or are under development. And in the end, the area will produce approximately 200 units of market rental. And they did not have to go through specific site by site rezoning process. This was district led. Um, so this is just a reminder of the rezoning process. Um, typically, the you go for first and second reading, um, and then we're discussing are the uses, densities, and setbacks and height in line with the OCP policies. Uh, from there, uh, council sets a date for the public hearing, and staff will gather all the necessary information uh, to present to council to make the decision. The public hearing is then held. Um, all the information is presented to council, and uh, council makes a decision. Uh, after that, uh, after the public hearing, no new information can be presented. Uh, so then it's up to council to decide if they give third reading or not. Uh, following third reading, uh, staff work with the applicant to meet any conditions required prior to adoption, such as registering legal agreements and other things like that. And then once uh, those are completed, uh, council can adopt the bylaw. Uh, so development permits are required for identify or for identified development permit er for development and identified development permit areas and normally follow the rezoning process to figure out some of the siting and form and character details. This is a stage where it's appropriate to get more specific than a rezoning, but not as specific as a building permit or servicing agreement. It's important to remember that in a DP process, uh, we are not dealing with servicing and what takes place outside the property. Um, but specifically what is going on on site and the form and character of the buildings. Uh, DP review is done by comparing the proposal to a set of guidelines. Um, because these are guidelines and not regulations, a healthy amount of a flexibility is required in the process. For instance, economic climate may impact the applicant's ability to follow certain guidelines, and that is a legitimate reason why not to apply a guideline. Um, what we often look for is whether a proposal generally complies with the guidelines or has made a reasonable attempt to follow the guidelines and the intention is met. 
Um, DPs may be approved and issued with or without conditions. Uh, the conditions must also be based on guidelines. And then DPs are also a tool to vary zoning regulations. And in those cases, uh, we add additional procedural steps for variants such as notification. So next up is temporary use permits. Uh, TUPs are a tool that is sort of a mix of a rezoning and a DP. Uh, in that they're not normally a form and character DP associated with a temporary activity. So the temporary use permit can address some of the aspects of form and character um, by uh, adding conditions. So if you issue a temporary use permit, you can include various conditions um, to address potentially some of the issues that you might see occurring from this temporary activity. And that concludes our presentations. We're happy to take further questions at this time. Thank you. I have a question myself and then we can go to council. Um, an interesting piece around development permits is that there's an expiration time on them. So once we issue a DP, they expire after two years. That's not the case with rezonings. And we have many examples where we've rezoned properties and they've sat idle for a long time. So I'm just curious, is it possible to put an expiration or a reverter cl clause on a rezoning? So if you don't take advantage and actually activate that rezoning in five or 10 years, then the commitments that we've made, you go back to an RS1. Uh, through the chair, so not necessarily what, what council and staff or the community's direction could be at that point would be to zone the property to something else at a certain point. Um, so where that's not possible is if there's, for example, a phase development agreement that would secure the zoning for a certain part, that's what we have on the ocean front. Elsewhere, if uh, the rezoning had not been built, then it would be at council's direction to rezone the land again to something else. Helpful to know. Uh, council, any other questions? Go ahead, Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, we didn't really touch on amenity zoning, and I'm just wondering if you can speak to uh, if we're looking at that, where we're looking at that, and sort of thinking about this in the context of our CAC policy discussions. And if, because I, I believe I've heard in the past that um, amenity zoning is the next step to move to, to give uh, a bit more certainty and so on to developers and help that process go quicker, but still make sure the community gets the amenities that we need. Uh, through the chair, yes. So that is a project that staff will be looking at in the near future through the Smart Growth Neighborhood Incentive. Um, obviously, the challenges are identifying what is an appropriate amenity for the level of density that is being provided. And given the current economic climate, it is uh, fairly challenging for developers to make things work. So we will be exploring that in the near future. Go ahead, Councillor Anderson. <clears throat> uh, what I have is more of a comment really i noticed uh, through the presentation that our focus throughout really is on residential zoning and there are other aspects of our zoning bylaw which we should be mindful of that is whether they may need some housekeeping or attention and they're quite specific and, and of course we're always dealing with residential development uh, it's an ongoing topic and these other say industrial zones they come up uh, episodically if you like uh, in the past, uh, we have, this is going back several years, an issue, for example, came up about our recycling zone, and I've forgotten offhand what that one is. We have in the business park a certain operation, the, the GFL operation, it's a specific zone, and new types of recycling have come forward, uh, wood waste, for example, and whether... Uh, it was a fit or whether it, it should have been included in that type of, these, these are unique issues that come up and have come up in the past. Another one that I'll point to is in our marine zone, we do not have a marine zone specific for port functions. We are using the I3 zone for our port lands. And that does not protect those lands for water dependent uses. That's just, these are just two, if you like, idiosyncratic examples, or they're unique, but these do come up, and perhaps we might be mindful that other corners of our zoning bylaw may deserve attention from time to time with respect to housekeeping or to address issues that, come, that do come forward. Thank you. Thank you for the comment, Councillor Anderson. Uh, Mayor Herford, go ahead. Thank you. On the inclusionary zoning um, piece, um, and, and Councillor Penningill got it. The amenity, the amenity zoning. I I think the um, um, 
in my understanding is is currently the um you know our, our CACs are really extracted through that rezoning process so the risk is if we open up that if that process is to be opened up we really need to figure out a way to account for the for the for those amenities and is that in, so do those two things go together that in, are inclusionary and amenity based zoning like are those are those two things sort of one in part and parcel like they get sort of wo those concepts get woven together in the policy that would come forward or are these pieces um are those two concepts sort of um, always separate? Uh, through the chair, I don't, they are, they can be separate concepts, but I think this is going to be something that we're exploring. Again, the challenge is going to be coming up with a density bonus scheme that actually gets built. You know, if you require too much and, and nothing gets built, then it's not, it's not very useful. Um, also, the province is likely going to be coming through with some changes in the fall. Uh, that may revisit the whole community amenity contribution scheme. We're not sure what that looks like yet, but there have been discussions about that. Great. So, um, I guess I've heard those uh, those noises as well on the um, sort of that the landscape's changing um, as we go. I think the um, and when I hear um, you know um, sort of focusing when that more more open inclusionary zoning um what tools exist in that in that realm to ensure that development those other principles around say i'll, I'll use transit you know developing close to core transit network and those other values get um uh, included in the inclusionary in the inclusionary zoning because to me that um the core transit network and everything within 100 meters of or whatever it is still creates uh, geographic lines and ends up actually maybe not being um, that as inclusionary as we're just kind of drawing the lines differently. Like, how does that stuff get accounted for as as a policy like that would be developed? Um, I mean, those are very good comments, and I think again that's going to be part of the discussion that we have when we bring this forward. Um, you know, uh, ultimately it will be up to council to make the decision, but. There's options, you, like you said, you could just draw that boundary, but then is it really that inclusionary and does it matter if it's a block further away and you still want to do the same form of housing? I think those are all important discussions that we'll have throughout that project. Thank you. I have Councillor Hamilton and then I'll put myself on the list. Let's get any other hands. Yeah, thanks. Through the chair, I've got uh, two questions. Um, the first is, as I've been learning this, this whole process over the last few, several months, um it's it it seems to me like we talk about and, and our conversation an hour ago as a as an example where we're concerned about what this amenity contributions and what how this community is gonna this neighborhood may contribute to our community and the community amenities but we're way back at the development zoning the the neighborhood planning phase um and so there's this this tension between rezoning and making sure you get everything you're going to need to get for the from this this um, this application, and I was intrigued by your your list of things required required for a rezoning. It was the use, the height, the density, and something else, I think. And to me, that seems like somebody could give us four or five numbers and say, "Can I rezone?" Whereas what we what, what we've seen is a full you know site plan. Here's the design. Here's does somebody need to have a full architectural layout with pictures of their development in order for us to consider a rezoning? Go ahead, Ms. Fletcher. Uh, through the chair, uh, it's not a requirement. Uh, all you need for rezoning is the numbers, as you said. Um, it has become a bit more of a precedent where we've asked for more and more information as, as things pursue, especially given the impact and understanding how it works with the neighborhood. Uh, but technically, only the numbers are required for a rezoning application to be made and for it to proceed. On that point, we've in, in the past, we've had some uh, rezoning applications come forward with like full video fly through of what uh, development might look like. And I think that we've had somewhere have been like very basic architectural drawings. So I feel like there's a there's a wide 
range of what the expectation is when it gets to this table. And I think we tend to set that um, as council uh, over the years. It, it builds up over time in terms of the questions that get asked at rezoning and committee the whole. Uh, and then that kind of directs staff's discussion with the applicants on on how they want to present that information so that's most likely to get support. And that's my thoughts on that, but staff can correct me if I'm wrong. I would concur with that statement. I think Councilor Hamilton had another question, then we'll go to Mayor Herford. Yeah, just a follow up comment on my question is that it, it seems to me, uh, and I'm again, I'm going to qualify this by being new to the process. It seems to me by us requiring more and more detailed information early, earlier, earlier and earlier in the process in an attempt to gain more certainty, we are preempting questions and conversations that should be happening later. And I understand how, why we're doing that. I believe we're doing it so that we can ensure that we're getting our, the community many con contributions correct and we're getting everything we can for our community. Uh, but I wonder how much efficiency we're losing in our development uh, potential. Uh, the second question then is on temporary use permits. Is it normal to provide a or require a security deposit of some kind to ensure that whatever temporary use is happening, um, any potential disadvantages or harms to the community that might come from this temporary use permit can be covered by this security deposit? Through the chair, I'm not sure if that is a common form of security that you would require. You could. For example, if it was a festival or something like that, require some sort of deposit to uh, cover the cost of putting the site back to where it was or doing landscaping or things like that. I think it would be challenging to quantify, you know, nuisance that some financially quantify a nuisance to a neighbor or something like that, and then uh, have a have a security based on that. But you know, to restore a, the landscaping or the terrain of the place back to how it was following a festival, that would be a common requirement that could be required. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Greenlock. So we haven't heard from her yet. Then Mayor Herford. Then myself. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I just wanted to make some comments on Councillor Ham Hamilton's line of questioning about the rezoning process and only needing those four numbers to go forward. I think one of the big issues is it is my understanding that the rezoning process is what triggers the conversations around DCCs and CACs. So how are you supposed to have kind of an educated opinion on what contributions should be made? Um, during rezoning, if in fact they're only supposed to be presenting these four or five pieces of information, like it seems like a bit of a chicken and egg scenario that's impossible to get in a linear fashion. Uh, through the chair, so DCCs are established by bylaw, and those are collected at building permit, and they're typically based on square footage. So if you they they wouldn't be paid until the building permit is is about to be issued. So you would know exactly how large of a development and the square footage. So that that allows for quite a bit of certainty. And I think developers are, you know, they they like DCCs. They know what they cost. CACs are negotiated on a project by project basis. So that's where it's more challenging. Um, and there's a bit like we have a policy that we're guided by, but um, sometimes those things change site site by site. And developers often express frustration with the uncertainty associated with those. Um, so that's where there's advantages to setting up a density bonus scheme where you, you know, it's in the zoning and the developers have some certainty uh, associated with what they're required to provide in order to achieve a specific level of density. Thanks. Yeah, and I think that's the approach the province is looking to bring forward in the fall is potentially formalizing the way that CACs are negotiated so that they're similar to DCCs, where it is just um, a little bit more black and white, uh, more by bylaw as opposed to site-by-site uh, -site negotiations. But the details are in, devils are in the details. Uh, Mayor Herford, go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to take us back to the, um, <laughs> the, that, discussion around rezoning and, and the level of detail at rezoning versus um, getting into the DP uh, area. And I think um, this is something that um, as much as the lines clearly defined, you know, sometimes we would, we'd like the, just that little bit more detail, but it is important, I think, for all of us at the table to, to understand where 
where that is and what's what is appropriate at the point in the process that we're that we're working on. And um, sometimes it's challenging for the community to understand that, you know, those those steps and and for ourselves as well, but it does take um, a level of discipline to under to sort of hold yourself to the appropriate level of detail where we where we are now, if a develop if a development um, that said it, it the next step, of course, is that is that DP um, uh, level of level of detail. So, um, you know, sometimes that that detail does exist and it's fine to ask those questions into that space, but um, it's hard to base decisions on what will be future decisions of the applicant if the rezoning is successful. So I think that's really important to be mindful of that as we have these conversations um, on various developments um, to make sure that we're, we're um, the development, the uh, proponents can actually meet our expectations, which should be communicated through our policies and our bylaws. And, uh, and that does define where, what is a DP issue and what is a, a rezone issue. So, um, you know, that they'll be up to our, our chairs during those meetings to keep us, you know, to that level. And often we hear from, from staff when we have asked too far, oh, that will be covered at DP. Like, okay, that's, you know, and have fit and have, uh, and know that that will happen in the, you know, in, in the process. So this is very much a trap where we want to see, you know, I, I often want to see right down to the, like the, the nitty gritty at a, at a, at a rezone, but, um, it's, it's, um, but it's challenging to hold yourself to the level that uh, that is appropriate for the for the conversation um, or the decision at the decision at hand, um, and maybe make notes to make sure that those things are addressed at the DP actually addressed at the DP phase because we've seen that before, as well where that's a DP issue and then we get to the DP and that issue still still exists and hasn't been resolved. So um, it's a it's a group effort, but I think it's the that dis, that group discipline to make sure that we're sort of t speaking at the appropriate level. Um, for the appropriate step in the in the process. So thank you for highlighting that, Councillor Hamilton. I agree. Yeah, and thanks for that commentary. I think that is why we're having this workshop today is really just to remind ourselves and in our community what the differences are in terms of the level of information that is to be expected at rezoning versus DP. Uh, I too have found myself uh, asking for additional form and character information at rezoning. Uh, so it's good for everybody to get reminded. So I think one of the challenges I have myself on the list and I'll go to Councillor Pettingill. One of the challenges is that as per your presentation, Mr. Daly and Ms. Fletcher, DPAs are non-discretionary. Um, and then we rely on the DPA guidelines, which are guidelines, they aren't requirements. And so they can be interpreted differently. And so I think that's where the tension is where we see at rezoning, we want to try and secure as much as possible because once we get to DP guidelines, there's variability. And so can you speak to where, if we're having challenges with application of the DP guidelines, how do we go about, like, what's the process for amending a DP guideline? What, like, are there DP guidelines that staff are looking at right now that might need to be updated? Um, if you can just speak a little bit about DP guidelines. Uh, through the chair, yeah. so DP guidelines are our guidelines and permits you to meet the general intent of the guidelines. Um, we are undertaking review of those DP guidelines currently um, and expect to bring that forward at some point in the fall, ideally, uh, or winter, depending. Um, so there are there are guidelines that are adequately vague that they cannot be applied um, consistently. Um, where council has not necessarily discretion, but if they don't feel that a guideline is being met, that can be referred back to staff if they're reviewing a guideline at council and staff can continue to look at that guideline. There is, um, but but again, it is a narrow discretion as you've as you've noted. And yeah, I, th I think, I guess an appropriate, you know, if you're trying, I, I get what you're, you're not wanting to lose the opportunity to address some of your concerns that you might have at, at a rezoning, so. Providing that that feedback at a committee of the whole meeting or something like that would probably be the appropriate place to do that to share your concerns to uh, to address that, um, and then staff can look for ways to secure secure that through a land development agreement. Um, there's also variances if there is a variance uh, proposed in as part of a DP application, um, then there is discretion that council has. But often, if you've just rezoned a property, hopefully there's no variances. <laughs> So yes, I, I would say that the appropriate time to to secure that would be in early discussions. That way staff could look at opportunities to, if it's something that can be addressed through the zoning bylaw, include it in the zone, and if not, secure it through the land development agreement. Got it, 
Thank you. And then I did have a question about the inclusionary zoning and some of our experiences in the past. I think of the ability of putting like triplexes, especially kind of in the area on the west side of the highway. Um, but we haven't necessarily seen a huge amount of uptake there. And so I'm just wondering if staff can speak to the beginning of the presentation where there is some interest in trying to maybe think about expanding some of our core zones like RS1 and RS2. Um, but what then are some of the limitations to actually being able to enable some of those diverse housing forms? Uh, yeah, so looking, thank you through the chair, um, looking at our zoning and being more inclusionary, um, the triplex zoning was, we've seen the uptake of, I believe one, we've had a couple come forward. Uh, our understanding is that right now financing does not work for less than five units on a lot. And that's just because of interest rates, for example, uh, and construction costs. And there are other financing available based on number of units. Um, and there are other parts of the zoning that make that more difficult to achieve, for example, like parking requirements um, and setbacks, for example. So all of this really does need to be reviewed holistically to see like where flexibility and zoning can achieve perhaps a different unit, unit mix while still preserving the intent of a residential neighborhood. Um, but there are, there are limitations from our regulations for sure and then limitations with what the market can provide, which is uh, why we haven't seen as much uptake. Thank you. And then finally, I heard staff refer to this idea of the smart growth neighborhood project. Um, does that include kind of this review of our core RS zones or is like, can you just speak a little bit more to that? I've, I've heard it referenced a few times, but I'm unsure of the scope of the work. I uh, yeah, through the chair. So the smart growth uh, incentive program uh, intends to take up the work that was started in 2020 and to bring that up where it does review uh, residential zoning um, and ways to include different a different variety of housing forms uh, in how to make zoning slightly more flexible uh, and to implement those smart growth principles around availability of uses around core transit networks to support that core transit network. Um, the review will be expanded a bit to include uh, sort of in advance of when the province does bring forward um, additional unit sizes, how our zoning will need to respond to that to maintain uh, what we need in terms of, again, servicing and setbacks to accommodate that, for example, so. Thank you, that's really helpful. I'll go to Councillor Pettingill, and then I have Councillor Hamilton. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, a neighborhood plan becomes part of the OCP, and anytime you rezone, it has to be done consistently with the OCP. So if you're rezoning, you're constrained by the OCP, neighborhood plan, all that sort of thing. Um, when I look at our OCP, it seems to me to be what I would, by what we've talked about, um, exclusionary, because you have residential, you have commercial, you have industrial. Would we expect or think we would need to um, make our OCP designations more inclusionary as well? And so there'd be a lot more overlap in theory between a residential and a commercial designation, or is our OCP sort of as it stands uh, completely supportive of what we would consider uh, inclusionary zoning. Uh, through the chair, I think generally, if you look at the policies within each of the land use designations, they are um, they would be considered inclusionary. Our residential zones specifically do speak about having an availability of uses nearby and a variety of housing forms to support attainability and affordability in housing. Uh, so, as part of this review, there isn't an intention to go forward and review our OCP policies. That likely won't happen until an OCP review in the future. Um, our commercial and industrial zoning are slightly more exclusionary in an attempt to preserve that land for those uses because we do know that we also have a deficit of employment lands in the district. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Hamilton. Thanks very much. Um, through the chair, this is maybe not a normal, not a normal question, certainly not one I've kind of contemplated asking before, but um, I've been finding myself meandering into some reading about urban planning. Um, and there seems to be a lot of, uh, a fair number of books, uh, layman sort of introductions to urban planning. Is there any reading that staff could suggest? And I'm putting you on the spot now. So if you <laughs> don't want to be on the spot and you want to think about it and send us a, a note on any readings that you think, uh, would help us, uh, or help you would have us help you do your job effectively by us understanding your job better. Uh, any recommended reading? Yeah. 
because we don't have enough reading. We'll pass it over to staff. Uh, through the chair, there's so many. I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, I think a, a recent favorite is a, an article called Home Sweet Home uh, about inclusionary zoning and housing choices, but there there is a ton of resources out there. Um, I'm sure we can put a reading list together. Yeah, Summer I reading list for August break. <laughs> Coming from community planning to your email soon. Councillor French, go ahead. Could I request that the list also include potential good videos in addition to reading? <laughs> well, a sure. bit more of a visual guy than a reading guy, and I got enough reading as it is. So I think um, videos and reading material would be helpful. Thank you. That's a request from council to staff. If we can have a reading list, please, that would be fantastic, including videos. Uh, there's a whole, there's YouTube channels on all of this and active transport. It's, yeah, we could go really far down the rabbit hole. Uh, Council, any further questions for staff around rezoning, development permits, development permit with variance, development variance permits, difference there between them? Not seeing, oh yeah, Mayor Herford, go ahead. Thank you. Um Let's take the opportunity to dig into TUP a little bit. And um, Councillor Hamilton was talking security deposits. I wonder about with TUPs. It's um, my understanding is that we can conditions can be applied to the to TUPs. And do we have examples of that happening in in the um, in the municipality? And could you speak to maybe a recent example of that or what that that could look like or has looked like in the past? Um. Great question uh, through the chair. So temporary use permits do allow you to do some really creative things. Um, and one example is there was a TUP for an axe throwing use in the business park uh, that did not continue. Um, and given the stresses we had seen in the business park, uh, we had added additional requirements for class B bicycle parking and additional stalls during the duration of the business. So um, a small example, but one example where you can look at the land use tensions and some of the feedback you get during um, during the notification period and add some additional requirements in the permit to try to address those so that the use is somewhat compatible in the area during its time. Okay, thank you. And that's an example of a physical, a physical change. Are there um, management level like and are there mechanisms for monitoring sort of compliance and like, how does, how does that sort of space work? Uh, so this is an older permit that I worked on a renewal for, but if you would call Chikai ranch was having events and because that was, that was very complicated because it was also in the Chikai fan debris flow hazard area. So they had to come up with a hazard assessment and an emergency evacuation plan. If something happened while there was an event there, and there had to be monitoring as well because they're adjacent to the Chikai River. And obviously there was concerns about, you know, uh, folks or, you know, pollution happening to the river. So there was all sorts of various conditions that were kind of established through these plans prepared by qualified professionals. Uh, so yes, you can get quite detailed with the conditions that you would like to impose if necessary, as again, it is discretionary. Uh, so if, if it's being considered by council, council can, decide what conditions they deem appropriate or what materials they need to make the decision. Thank you. And what was the monitoring of those conditions look like? We'll use that. That's a fine, that's a fine example. Um, if, if, could you speak to like how that was monitored versus I, I'm interested in the contrast between a uh, complaint based, you know, bylaw versus, um, you know, a condition of something like a TUP that, um, we need to ensure is, is met and, and perhaps that, um, complaint base isn't the appropriate mechanism, or is that what we rely on? Uh, it kind of depends on the nature of the condition. So for an environmental condition, typically in the report, the qualified professional would prepare a monitoring plan. Um, it's not uncommon if similar for a development permit, they outline what they're gonna do during construction and how they're gonna go out and look at that. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, the That was a pretty unique case with Chikai Ranch. They had to have someone you know, monitoring in case there was a, debris flow event and then set off an alarm that would turn off all the music and then everyone would have to go up onto a thing. So, I mean, that's kind of very one-off and unique and 
uh, hopefully you'd never actually have to monitor that, but it would be like, there's, there's kind of a, a wide range uh, depending on the nature of the condition. Thank you, Councillor Pettingill. Uh, is it uh, permissible, I guess, for something like monitoring and monitoring conditions that uh, a proponent fund the district to do the monitoring or, you know, are we sort of limited to, um, you know, self self monitoring? Uh, again, I think it depends on what the nature of the condition is and what the nature of the temporary use is. Um, so if it's some large event that obviously has the funds to support that, that would probably be a reasonable thing to ask. Um, but again, it, it could be very specific to what what condition you're looking to impose. And then in terms of violations of conditions, how does it work? Is it like if there's a violation and there's no compliance within two days, we can send in the SWAT team or it's like we, uh, we, you know, you just won't get your renewal if there's a renewal av available, like, or somewhere in between, where's the. I'll let Steph answer, but I want to clarify that we do not have a SWAT team. We do not have access to the SWAT team as a provincial, uh, asset. Uh, I think it would have to go again, you'd have to look at the condition and what the requirement is. It might be a revocation of the business license or a revocation of the permit. So that temporary use is no longer permitted. Um, that would be what I would suspect would be the limits of the powers to um, enforce that. All right, not seeing any more hands. I think our presentation is done. I want to thank staff for answering our questions, for bringing forward a really fulsome discussion and the slides to inform us on the difference between rezoning, development permit applications, and get us thinking about inclusionary zoning and temporary use permits. All exciting things. Look forward to reading and watching more during our August break. Uh, and with that, we will recess until 1.15. Thank you very much, everybody. On item three sub four with Ms. McJanet is bringing us the Squamish Marine Access Review Update and Discussion Draft. I'll pass it over to you, Ms. McJanet, for your presentation, and then we'll do discussion and questions after the fact. Great. Hi, Council. Hi to community that's joining us online. My name is Sarah McJanet, a planner with the planning department. Uh, and the discussion draft that we're presenting today for the Squamish Marine Access Review is for your input prior to a final round of engagement for finalization, completion, and council endorsement uh, later in the fall. Uh, we're requesting council input on the draft recommendations uh, to allow us to um, get a sense for implementing next steps and proposing future budget for priority items. So the project's purpose is to assess community ocean access needs and improve planning and coordination uh, of marine access areas and infrastructure uh, so that we can improve ocean access for all marine users and also protect our sensitive areas. And the project is quite focused on tactical plans for accessibility, coordination, and management of existing interim as well as future planned uh, marine access points. And we've also done a special uh, boat launch study uh, and presented some recommendations on that as well. So uh, this project does advance a whole array of strategic directions and individual actions that are outlined in our marine action strategy. Um, and uh, on the map here, you can see our downtown core review area that includes community water access um, and infrastructure within the Mamquem blind channel, both uh, or within the upper, mid and lower reaches, as well as Cattermole Slough. And this is the core area that has quite a high diversity of marine use and activity areas and a variety of water access points in a quite a compact area warranting close coordination uh, for safety and compatibility and accessibility of these um, access areas. And then in addition, the Squamish River Estuary and Spit, as well as Darrell Bay, are highly connected context areas that we have been considering all along in the context of our, our downtown core as well. Uh, so stage one uh, of this marine uh, review was initiated back in February of 2022. We did major engagement activities uh, in the spring of 2022. 
uh, we were in front of you, um, most of you, uh, uh, last April, presenting engagement results and preliminary directions, uh, including the boat launch situational analysis and key criteria, sorry, key criteria for boat launching facilities. And council provided some initial comment at that time. And then stage two uh, has involved incorporating inputs and creating the discussion draft that has been attached today with recommendations. And uh, um, this stage has progressed slower than anticipated due to work that's been happening in parallel with the Mamquan Blind Channel uh, maintenance and funding strategy engagement. Uh, and so uh, completion of this draft, as well as the um, mapping has subsequently extended into 2023. Uh, so at this point, we're seeking a final round of uh, community comments following council's preview uh, of the discussion draft today. Um, and so in the actual uh, marine access review, you'll see more of a two stage engagement process. We've kind of merged stage two and three. Uh, just to, inter, uh, to recap, um, we've done a lot of intergovernmental uh, as well as stakeholder and broad public engagement for this review. Uh, it's been happening at the IAP2 consult level. Uh, we shared these engagement highlights um, and I'll just recap in a couple slides just to bring it all together. So we used a, a lot of different engagement tools, communications and activities and outreach for this project. Uh, we uh, established a dedicated project page on Let's Talk Squamish what, right when we were um, uh, initiating that platform. We did in-person pop-ups, uh, two extremely detailed uh, uh, surveys, and had an online interactive map tool. And all of these uh, tools and input opportunities were broadly uh, promoted. Uh, and we made a huge effort um, to solicit detailed input through the marine surveys. And this hasn't been done before, uh, to my knowledge, around these um, specific questions around marine access and activities. Um, and because we've experienced so much growth in the last 10 years, it was really helpful to see where people are at with marine access. Um, and so the uh, project page on Let's Talk Squamish drove uh, 460 new registrations to the site and we had over 2,400 visits uh, to the Let's Talk Squamish page. The participation, it was really strong through the, the two distinct surveys. So one was a community recreation survey and the other was a business and in industry survey. Uh, and so we had 347 community rec surveys completed, 41 business and industry uh, surveys completed. We had um, broad resident and visitor multi-age participation. The top uh, pie chart is my favorite uh, input from folks for age 11 to 82. Um, and the participants were active in local marine recreation and stewardship groups. There was, there was about an 80 to 20 um, split. So 80% of the, um, the respondents were uh, involved in non-motorized activity, whereas 20% were motorized. Um, and then on the business side, we had multi-sector representation, a uh, really high number of respondents from arts, entertainment, and recreation, as well as transportation and warehousing, accommodation and food service, uh, agriculture, forestry, and fishing, as well as um, mining, oil, and gas, and other, um, other business representation. And in terms of uh, the economic clusters, we had um, high 38% uh, tourism business participation, as well as those that identified as part of the ocean economy, commercial transportation, as well as forestry and green tech. 53% um, of those businesses are on the water daily. So that was great to learn. The split between motorized and non-motorized activities for the business respondents was 70% motorized, 30% non-motorized. And then we had a, um, lots of contribution to the online interactive mapping tool with uh, respondents placing over 350 pins in locations in the marine environment and, and telling us a lot about what, uh, what they um, felt were priorities. Um, so we got valuable data on uh, community marine use and waterfront activity areas. We, we received information about watercraft and vessel particulars for both personal and business use. We learned about moorage, uh, wait lists and fees and views on marine accessibility, health, safety, shared use, 
and the relative importance of a variety of amenities and infrastructure for the future. This is a quick snapshot that you've seen once before that just highlights a snapshot of ocean folk and their top recreational and leisure activities. So you can see um, based on the number of responses, walking and hiking along foreshores, uh, very highly um, or a, a high number of folks involved in that activity. Stand up paddling um, is is growing um, uh, as well as motorized boat, boating, wind sports, even ocean swimming, even though it's cold water, there's a lot of ocean swimmers um, as well as uh, folks in, um, engaged in nature study, wildlife viewing, fishing, harvesting and sailing activities. That's on the rec side, and I'll speak more to the commercial side in a little bit. Um, we learned a lot about marine access barriers. So the top marine access barriers were lack of marine, uh, the sense of lack of marine access in general, followed by lack of parking at marine access locations. And we also heard a lot about the uh, training berm uh, removal, the removal um, or the um, removal at the spit. Um, also, not having a formalized boat launch access and current construction downtown uh, were also raised as big barriers. And for the business uh, survey respondents, um, similar marine access barriers, but also for commercial marine activity, uh, congestion and traffic uh, came up as a, as a barrier uh, for those uses, as well as issues with um, a lack of dredging and shallow channel depths that are impacting safe navigation um, and uh, inadequate uh, boat, boat and um, barge facility access um, were also raised there. Uh, so the top themes uh, that emerged through that engagement, uh, we heard clearly how vital ocean access is for the community. Uh, we folks showed or shared deep or high concern uh, about disruptions to waterfront access during the wave of construction that we're experiencing, as well as recent changes um, in the community, including uh, changes at the Squamish Spit. There is a growing demand uh, within the community um, in, in the marine environment around activities um, and limited access areas are creating congestion and impacts on natural areas. There's a, a worry about overall net loss of, of areas for marine access and that we're missing opportunity to secure access in the interim and the long term. In terms of needs, uh, the community told us about a desire to see a really proactive focus, leadership and priority around public access. And also uh, would like to see a, a clearly communicated holistic picture for marine access areas and planned infrastructure. Um, and then active management of these shared spaces uh, also for uh, marine safety. So in response, and, and this was a deliverable that we outlined at the very beginning of the project, we uh, created a, a series of marine access reference maps. Um, that's uh, for our uh, ongoing use and planning, but also to present out to the community for clarity and understanding. So these maps, uh, they were uh, connected to your package. Uh, they are still in draft. Uh, so there's still uh, opportunity to adjust and finalize them. Uh, they present that consolidated picture um, of marine access areas. They highlight the downtown lands and waters, navigation areas, managed areas, as well as uh, water and upland uses, access points along the, the foreshore, and then all of that those layers of future um, existing and future planned uh, amenities and facilities. So these are really intended as a point of reference for ongoing input, discussion, and continued planning and management. We've also put together a marine uh, waterfront park inventory in progress. So this, I've got some actual copies too, because I recognize it might be hard to see uh, the, the detail, but it was a bit of an exercise to start to map out all of the amenities and infrastructure that we um, are, are in there. Okay, so the launch situation report that is enclosed there uh, highlights um, a lot of the, the challenges with the existing, uh, with, with existing launching. And um, uh, sorry, 
we understand that there is this all season uh, shared use uh, for both recreational and commercial use. Um, and that its uh, condition is deteriorating. It's in uh, poor physical condition. There are tidal constraints. Um, there's no sort of tie up floats. It's very challenging uh, in terms of launching. And also there's limited uh, capacity and um, no par upland parking that's secured. So there are frequent wait times uh, during peak periods. And then launching of course is challenged um, because of the sedimentation situation in the blind channel. Uh, this here you can see um, in terms of um, uh, from our survey across different criteria, five different criteria, uh, respondents cons consistently ranked boat launch launching experience quite poorly, as you can see in the green um, in terms of ease of use, safety, parking availability, accessibility, and information and signage. Uh, so the specific conditions and physical attributes at the existing launch have been investigated. Uh, and in terms of location, it is convenient uh, being in a, the downtown location. It's relatively sheltered, but it is in close proximity to the docks within the small craft harbor, uh, making it difficult to navigate. Uh, it's also uh, challenged because of the transportation uh, network on the upland. Uh, of course, the proximity to loggers lean, there's not a lot of maneuvering room uh, in that space. Um, and also the, uh, these upland lots are quite shallow, so there's not a lot of space there. Um, until loggers lane is realigned south of Vancouver Street for enhanced oceanfront access, there really are limited options right now for reconfiguring or trying to help support um, trailer parking at this location. So moving forward, the community highlighted that there are, um, they see top priorities in terms of interim access for uh, boat launching, um, including physical ramp improvements um, at the site and then securing uh, parking. In the, in the review, we do look through or present uh, launch planning and design criteria. So. Um, we understand that the single lane launch is viewed as an undersized in the community. A two lane facility with proper parking may reduce congestion, con conflict and launch and retrieval times. Uh, we've looked in detail at um, two lane launch configurations. It's estimated that upwards of 40 to 45 uh, spaces up would be uh, required on the upland parking for optimal use. This corresponds to an upland area around 0.7 to 0.8 hectares. Um, and so uh, that's helpful to know as we're looking for um, optimal sites for, for safe circulation and road, uh, road network integration as well. I'll just get into the boat launch recommendations that are presented today. Um, so uh, there are several recommendations for launching sites and area planning to be conducted. Um, the first is uh, examining local, uh, examining community land leasing or licensing on a short term basis to support interim parking and access solutions at the current launch site. Uh, we know that um, it's extremely difficult for community groups, residents and businesses to coordinate access discussions amongst all of the landowners and agencies and uh, marine access or marine uh, survey respondents are also quite concerned about the risk of closure um, and lack of a formalized launching and parking area. So there uh, is potentially a local government role to help um, to coordinate um, with landowners in the vicinity. Staff also have recommended uh, initiating uh, cost planning to understand the cost for land licensing for any interim boat launch upland parking area support. Um, so that we can understand what those costs might be for future um, uh, consideration. Also, there's um, leadership in this area is also warranted because of there's a parallel need for us to look at interim uh, flood protection measures in this area. Um, under our integrated flood hazard management plan, this area is a, a um, a future study area and because of the flooding that we experienced in December, it's uh, evident that we do need to look at um, uh, interim measures to prevent storm surge and um, localized flooding in downtown south in future. Um, there's also a recommendation around uh, 
referring boat launch facility uh, feasibility ownership and management questions to the Parks and Rec Master Plan update in 2024. Um, and so uh, we'd like to uh, propose this and it's timely. Um, these are important questions and, and many communities have integrated boat launching facilities within their parks network. We also uh, see a, a, a recommended need to develop guidelines uh, for commercial shared use of launch facilities to guide uh, the recreational as well as commercial use and promote safety and identify conditions for um, commercial activities such as barging. Right now, all of that is happening at the launch and there are examples such as the Talista Park uh, boat launch in Sydney, BC, where they have established some community um, commercial use guidelines that, that help on that front. And then further on the boat launching, uh, there's a recommendation to further explore, evaluate, and look at feasibility for uh, boat launch and marine employment uses at a number of different sites. So these are uh, the sites are Darrell Bay in Squamish South, the west side of Mamquemplain Channel, as well as the east side of the channel at Site B, where Squamish Nation-led planning is getting underway. So th this is an image of um, of those uh, sites. So Darrell Bay on the left, which is um, uh, was zoned M5 for marine transportation facility in the recent marine zoning. On the west uh, side of Mamquemplain Channel, there are uh, potential synergies uh, with planned commercial node there. So there's a interest in exploring waterfront employment uses and access um, there going forward, as well as Site B, where, as I mentioned, Squamish Nation is undertaking comprehensive uh, land use and capital planning for priority sites within the territory. Um, so there's an opportunity to explore marine supportive uses and access opportunities there as well. Uh, in addition, uh, with the marine sector impact study that's planned for 2024, uh, we would like to bring a lot of the engagement um, and learnings from the marine access review into that work um, it, and include engagement and research on specific waterfront employment, land and marine access needs um, and really uh, deep dive and detail the supply and suitability um, of land and water dependent uses. Um, for marine sectors in the community as part of that work. So dovetail uh, with that work there. Finally, there's some overall access recommendations um, and uh, I'll just highlight those here. Um, uh, we've basically uh, theme, like clustered them in themes. So the first is around downtown construction staging and marine access communication plans. So the recommendation is to um, uh, basically um, highlight short-term and parking staging and facilities um, and undertake uh, parking demand management uh, within these key areas and then explore the idea of uh, a marine adventure hub. We um, have introduced this concept on land, uh, so there's an opportunity to look at marine adventure hubs as well. And then uh, there's a suite of recommendations around responsible marine uh, recreating uh, in sensitive areas um, looking at education and campaigns. So we have a responsible recreating guide, but again, it's terrestrial focus. So there's an opportunity to publish information and apply a marine lens. Um, and then work with uh, Transport Canada Office of Boating Safety and MSAR around uh, safe boating and community um, education. Uh, we'd also like to bring forward in future budget um, for uh, inst installing signage at marine access areas and working also with the province and uh, Squamish Nation around uh, key sites and areas. Um, this is an ongoing discussion that we've been having with uh, Squamish Nation through the referral for this project. Um, and they've identified a priority around um, signage and community education to highlight ecologically and culturally sensitive areas within their territory. Uh, and then work with the province and Squamish Nation, as well as um, uh, organizations like Squamish Wind Sports Society, Tourism Squamish, uh, and the terminals is uh, ongoing around looking at um, uh, recreation management and designating water access areas uh, within the, the wildlife management area. Uh, and then there's a final cluster of uh, recommendations around our community blue way network, uh, waterfront park and amenity coordination. Uh, and so these are focused around 
um, creating that holistic picture uh, for our blue ways, helping to ensure that we're addressing identified needs, gaps, and opportunities for civic and park planning um, decisions that are going on. Uh, and coordinating these marine access points and facility details is quite helpful. Uh, we'd like to include a specific focus on Rose Park revitalization in the upper Mamquem Blind Channel uh, and looking at desired community water access in the southern part of the upper uh, part of the channel there. Uh, the community is highlighted for us. There's high interest here. We'd also like to uh, recommend advancing the long-term plans for water access at Wuneak Park. Uh, as well as continued planning for oceanfront um, access implementation, including the sailing center um, and also uh, universal accessibility guidelines for water access infrastructure. City of Vancouver has created some excellent guidelines and uh, with the focus on accessibility, uh, we see this as another opportunity to, to help create some um, intention and, and um, resources around accessibility for design. So, um, there's a lot, uh, within this marine access review. Um, thanks for your uh, attention as I tried to summarize for final engagement, uh, for the summer, uh, to wrap up the marine access review. We've identified this last round of engagement. Um, we have placed the discussion draft on the let's talk Squamish project page. Uh, we would like to do some community pop-ups this summer. Um, and also we will continue continued intergovernmental engagement and outreach with landowners and tenure holders. And we'll be doing a last round of direct outreach with all the folks that we've been engaging with to date, uh, including uh, Tourism Squamish, the Chamber and the BIA. So uh, still, still a little bit more work to come, but we are trying to wrap it up um, so that we can uh, move forward with um, next steps and implementation. The recommendations in the report today are uh, that council receive the marine access review discussion draft document uh, that um, we receive feedback um, to be determined uh, from council at this time. And also that council directs staff to solicit final input um, and comment from the community on the discussion draft before bringing it back for uh, final endorsement consideration. There is uh, some, there are some additional um, alternate motions, but I, I'll stop there and welcome your comments and questions and feedback. Thank you. And thank you so much for the presentation, Ms. McGannett, and all of the work. Um, it's definitely very detailed and lots to dig into. So I'll open it up to council for general questions, but um, just keep in mind that we're trying to, at the end of this conversation, get Ms. McJanet some feedback on the recommendations and the implementation items that are within this document presented, but we can broaden our scope of questions uh, to the document as a whole. Who would like to kick us off? I have Councillor French, and then I'll have Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Chair. And uh, it, it it didn't struck me, struck, it didn't hit me until today <laughs> that um, there's very little mention of Watts Point in in all of this. Uh, which surprised me when I made the realization today. So I did a quick search of the word Watt, and it only comes up once. And it's part of uh, a list of other marine access points. So uh, my question out of that is, uh, is that intentional? Is there something about Watts Point that doesn't um, make it ideal um, in fitting into this work? Through the chair, thank you for the question about Watts Point. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, area for sure. It um, because there's no sort of direct. Um, I guess in terms of the the uses and the um, industrial activities that are happening there, we can absolutely uh, highlight that in terms of access, and that would be an important. Um, piece to add to the picture uh, on the recreational side. There's no um, direct kind of uh, access points to Watts from land, but certainly it's a, a destination um, and um, people are passing by that area and, and part of, but I think a lot of the other recreational activity is happening more on the west side connected to the Sea to Sky Marine Trail, um, but it's point taken around um, acknowledging the marine access needs for Watts um, and the uses that are occurring there. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thank you. I have Councillor Anderson and Councillor Hamilton. Um, I find it useful that um, there is some nuanced description of the types of barges that are at issue for us for the most part in the Mequimbland Channel, 100 foot barges that are typically used for uh, brick, uh, building packages, uh, construction equipment, that type of thing. And it's, that is a distinct category of barge vessel and vessel type. However, in the Mountain Blind Channel and beyond, there are other categories of barging, including for bulk at Site B, whether logs, chips, uh, aggregate is another type of vessel. We have also barge vessels such as the Flotel at Woodfiber, which are quite common here in our coast for camps and uh, construction and dredging barges. My question, Ms. McJanet, is, it, would it be of use to distinguish these vessel types, perhaps with some industry expertise, to further refine the needs and the uh, terminal facilities, uh, um, I was, I'm going to say parking facilities for barges that we should consider in the blind channel. Uh, but I think that uh, the targeting of the, of the barge types that are in if you like, interface with our recreational boating infrastructure is the right way to go. But perhaps we should think more broadly about barges. They're going to be a fact of life on the Squamish waterfront in a variety of ways and vessel types. Thank you so much, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I, through the chair, I absolutely um, acknowledge there's a range of uh, barge, um, barge vessels uh, and activities historically, presently, and probably in the future. So I think that we can highlight some of those things um, in consultation with uh, marine sector representatives to better highlight those uh, within the marine access review as well. Thank you. I'm sure that some very qualified expertise is readily available uh, locally or otherwise uh, on that topic. My second question concerns the oceanfront subarea plan, and it is referenced on page five and page 25, and the current status of it and uh, uh, its role in the context of the puzzles we're trying to solve. I'm going to cite from the 2015 subarea plan concerning waterfront employment area and 5331 objectives and 5332 policies. Well, I'm not going to cite it. I'm just going to summarize. It is full of reference to marine light industry. And the wording is quite explicit. We're talking about um, industrial. We're talking about, uh, for example, in the permitted uses, small-scale manufacture, uh, boat building. Uh, we're talking about office uses only allowed if they're connected to the marine light industry. So this is a, uh, a heavier or a different type of use than what is, is uh, now being, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go that far. I'm going to ask, uh, since it has become clear, although not in any explicit report to council, that the current owners of the oceanfront uh, lands are um, advising or oriented away from this direction, what would prompt us then to review the status of that subarea plan? And I'm not suggesting that Matthews West, the owners, would be unamenable to discussing this. In fact, I think rather that they would be interested. But what would prompt a discussion of a revision or the current status of those plans for waterfront employment, which so clearly impact the subject at hand, access to the water for working harbor uses? Thank you so much. Uh, great comments and questions. Um, I'll do my best to sort of unpack a few of those things and then hopefully if I you want to um, add any um, additional clarification that's helpful too. I think ultimately what's prompting um, review of and a revisitation potentially of some of the um, the oceanfront sub area plan pieces is this marine access review. I think what we've learned and in taking stock of um, the intent of the needs for the community and looking at the, um, the all of the waterfront lands and the redevelopment plans on the whole is that um, and hearing from business uh, and industrial uh, uh, representatives within the community about needs there is a question about where do some of those uses fit? 
Um, have we, is there a place for those uses uh, within our community and on the, with these water dependent uses? So um, we have businesses that are engaged in marine refit and repair um, that are basically are not on the waterfront and have no facilities to, um, uh, no facilities currently that meet their needs and they're on the water daily, they're uh, dragging boats uh, and vessels through the community. Um, so I think that the marine access review and what we're learning is is starting to prompt some more thinking, emergent thinking around where can these, you know, where do these uses fit? Um, also through the, um, the oceanfront uh, master planning and development, some of the marine uh, employment uses and where those sat on the in the oceanfront um, site under the CD69 zoning, uh, those ha have not necessarily come forward in the way that they might have been thought of uh, way back in the day. So um, this is really uh, the marine access review and the recommendations that are coming forward are really just seeding some consideration. So it's really starting to try and uh, open the thinking around um, these types of uses and a lot more engagement is required to deep dive on these um, these matters. And so we just wanted to introduce the idea um, that more planning is uh, we think is um, warranted uh, to ba basically understand where these uses might fit uh, in the future. And it also ties in with all of that, um, the marine um, sector impact and what sector impact study, what opportunities um, are we foregoing if we don't find a place for these types of uses within the community? Uh, and is it, yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick clarification on the um, marine sector impact study. Is that being led by planning or by economic development? Uh, through council, that is being led by the economic development department uh, with uh, participation uh, with planning. Thank you for that clarification. Um, okay, I have Councillor Hamilton and Councillor Pettingill. Thanks very much for the detailed report and all of the work that you're doing uh, on this. Uh, question through the chair. So in the report, uh, wind sports is mentioned, and uh, if I... I'll attempt to pronounce it. Uh, is it Pepahim, the name for the island? Um, is is mentioned as as a site that's um, being uh, allocated for for wind sport use. Uh, but I, if I understand correctly, access to that island is is still a challenge. Is there a plan for facilitating any access or a plan for facilitating a space for wind sports to develop an access point to that island? Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, through to all of council, absolutely. There, so major changes, obviously, at the Squamish uh, Spit. Um, the Wind Sports Society has a license, a sub license agreement with um, the district for the new Spit Island. Uh, it's pronounced uh, Pepehem, uh, as I'm learning. Um, and uh, so, access right now uh, in the interim is being uh, provided by the Wind Sports Society primarily through this uh, a shuttle service from the Mamquan Blind Channel uh, to the island. And we are in discussion uh, with the province and Squamish Nation as part of the, um, the SPIT vision access group discussions that, uh, so that engagement uh, began in 2021 or maybe even a little bit earlier, 2020. Uh, so we've been re-engaging re uh, with that group to talk about long-term access uh, solutions for wind sport users. Um, it's uh, right now the Wind Sports Society has uh, highlighted for us that uh, in terms of boat pickup, um, picking up at the end of the spit road is, um, or the former or the new end of the road out there is uh, not safe at this point in time. There's high water flows and a lot of uh, wood debris in the water. So they're very, um, uh, they've got a system to do the shuttle service and they're working with Matthews West right now at the oceanfront around staging for parking out there. Um, 
And so, uh, but over the long term, we are going to continue to sit with the province and the nation around looking at designated access areas. And it's not just um, for wind sport users, it's also for other uh, water users, kayakers, uh, paddle boarders as well. And it's part of a larger discussion with the province um, around access and user or use management within the WMA at this time. Just go uh, ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Thanks. Uh, as a follow up, so outside of the WMA, um, I, uh, is there is there a reason? So I, I would have expected to see some plan for their access, for some access, if we were planning on it, uh, some kind of a space for them to allocate a, a shuttle boat or something. I would have expected to see that in this plan. But I don't see it. Is there a reason why it's not there? Is it just too new a change, or um, yeah, you know, why don't we see what our plan is in this study? Thank you for the question. Uh, the plans are emerging and under development, so they're not solidified at this time. Certainly, with the ocean front, uh, with the wind and water sport beach, that does provide some opportunity for wind sport access, but it's not. Um, um, necessarily the full access that that all wind sport users um, uh, are interested in. So it's kind of more suitable for uh, wing foiling and and um, and for experienced uh, kiters. The Spit Island is still um, uh, a facility that's very much um, helpful for people that are learning. Uh, and so that continued access out to Spit Island is a, a long-term desire. Um, but there are some different opportunities and we're absolutely uh, supporting those conversations uh, with wind sports around that shuttle service and what does that look like uh, for the interim, but also for, for the mid to long-term as well. So uh, that those would be incorporated into the marine access plans uh, once determined and solidified. Thanks very much. I will also just highlight that is one of the recommendations that's included in the report under the WMA access management plans is to continue that engagement. So it is highlighted as a recommendation, but not with a definitive solution at this point. Um, I'll go to Councillor Pettingill, then Mayor Herford. Thanks, and, and hopefully I'm not drawing too many conclusions here, but when I read the report, uh, the implication for me is that Daryl Bay is probably likely going to be very important in terms of boat launching. It's probably not going to meet all of our needs, but we're also seeing that as a longer term uh, thing rather than short or medium term. Is that accurate? With Daryl Bay, the conversations that we've been having with the province um, and uh, this um, engagement uh, with the province began with the marine zoning review. Uh, so that uh, terminal facility, uh, ferry terminal facility, and the, the transportation kind of uses within that zone and area. Um, the province is open to us exploring feasibility for co-location, but there's a lot of uh, study that's required. Um, certainly the um, engagement with the Squamish uh, boat launch um, committee, <laughs> um, grassroots committee has highlighted that as a high interest and a lot of users, um, marine users highlighted Daryl Bay as a, as a potential, um, launch uh, facility in site for the long term. Uh, in the marine access review, we do include a table where we start to look at, you know, kind of comparing area upland areas and um, highway access and different attributes. Um, certainly uh, the area there is not as big as um, there um, we see in the downtown or other site uh, site potential for site B for launching. And I just wanna highlight too that we are looking at um, Facilities that are not necessary that are not exclusively for residential launching or, or recreational launch and residential. Uh, you were just talking about residential earlier today. That's why it's in my mind um, for recreational launching. So we're looking at more of an integrated uh, approach to recreational and commercial use facilities initially. Um, Daryl Bay has uh, a smaller site area, so it's to be determined whether you could easily accommodate a more fulsome uh, launch facility there. And also uh, in terms of co-location with a ferry terminal um, and with the docks and marine transportation services that are there. So, uh, and obviously um, that would not necessarily be for uh, an immediate term um, 
um, contemplation. It would be something that it would be looked at for more longer term in that South, South Bay. Okay, thank you. And maybe this is um, getting into a bit of a comment, but I guess I've I heard, um, but not firsthand. And so I don't know if it's accurate that the province is maybe reconsidering some of the facilities at Portal Cove and whether or not those would be available. And so for me, um, that raises concerns about Daryl Bay, what's going to happen there. And we already sort of, I would suggest, see misalignment between uses at Daryl Bay and where our community's economic and recreational and so on interests are. So uh, I guess my preference would be that we'd be more uh, as active as possible on that topic uh, for, for numerous reasons. Um, and, and so, yeah, I would like to see sort of personally us pursuing Daryl Bay uh, as part of a solution uh, and talking about emergency access and all these things with the province. And, and I know we are having those discussions, but I think prioritizing those. Um, switching gears, you know, the, the report does speak to sort of everyone would like everything and everyone to have all access, but we know we have limited resources and lots of competing interests. So we're likely going to have to prioritize. And, you know, I didn't see a lot of discussion in this paper, although outside of it in meetings, you know, you hear about glass sponge reefs and the dolphins and the whales and the herring and, and all the impacts we have as people. And there seemed to be a fair skewing towards non-motorized use um, but then there's also discussion about, you know, oil and gas. And uh, my colleague mentioned, you know, flotels and supporting flotel barges and so on. And if we have sort of limited use, when or how do we sort of start to prioritize what sorts of things, what sorts of activities we want to support? Is it, Are you looking for that feedback now from council or we have those discussions once there's been more engagement or, or when or how does that happen? Thank you for the questions and comments. I will try my best to um, respond to those. I, I also just want to thank you for the flag about uh, any potential changes at Porto. I want to highlight, I'm not aware of any uh, um, potential changes uh, with the launch uh, facility at Porto, but I will definitely inquire. Um, I understand that the province has been looking more broadly at marine access and marine recreational facilities within um, within BC parks. Uh, so there's some parks planning that's been happening, um, but I'm not aware of any specific changes um, there, but I will inquire. Um, in terms of the, the discussion around uh, the breadth of different uses uh, within our marine areas and prioritizing uses, um, I think that at this stage in the marine access planning, we've just been highlighting um, the breadth of those uses, where they're occurring, understanding what the um, where some of the um, the challenges are, uh, and we know that. Um, and because of the core focus area uh, for the marine access review being within the MAMQAM blind channel, uh, where it's very uh, compact area, there's lots of access points and lots of planned infrastructure, that really has been the focus as opposed to kind of um, broader recreation happening kind of beyond that core area. Um, so we're not at a, at a place where we're like prioritizing um, one use over another we're just acknowledging all of the different uses that are happening uh, within these areas we do on the upland side have within our downtown plans and our sub area plans we have highlighted the vision and um uh you know future uses being contemplated in those facilities so in so far as those um master plans have been set we're helping to try and support and make sure that the marine access pieces that are connected to those uplands um, are holistically working and uh, coordinated um, and meeting the needs um, that the community is, has around getting on the water safely, those kinds of things. So I hope that that maybe touches on sort of the question around, are we prioritizing specific uses? It's more about um, coordinating the, the planned uses that, that are on the table um, through our, our community plans right now. Go ahead, Councillor Penningill. So if if I can clarify a bit, maybe like from what I've seen here, we might head in a direction where we develop a boat launch or boat launches that prioritize 
large fast speed boat access or heavy motorized traffic, which then results in a lot of people zipping around big motors on, on the sound. I don't know if that's the desired outcome um, or, you know, maybe big oil and gas barges or something. I don't know if that's our desired. So is there a point where we sort of talk about, you know, to the degree there's a boat launch, we want them more skewed towards recreational access or, or you know, or one lane for non-motorized and one lane for motorized or this sort of prioritization. Is there a time when we talk about that? Um, the, definitely. I, I think the question um, that I'm hearing from you is um, through to the Olive Council is, is around um, a variety of motorized versus non-motorized uses and the compatibility of those uses and maybe prioritizing or skewing more of the planning around non-motorized. It sounds like that's maybe what you're asking. A, a little bit. I, I want to be um, maybe a bit broader than that because there's, you know, there's things about risk of spills and so on, but it's not so much just about motorized and motorized, but motorized and non-motorized, but the types of activities that are happening more broadly out in the sound as a result of what we do in terms of access. So I think it's more than just motorized, non-motorized, but, you know, is there a point where we contemplate that and beyond the impacts on upland, thinking about the impacts on the actual sound? Just pausing to reflect. Thanks. Um, uh, I would say that um, at this point, we have not brought that uh, layer into the marine access review at this time. Um, certainly, there are some um, probably higher level kind of community objectives um, around um, supporting um, around our climate action goals, around um, protection, coastal ecosystem protection, those kind of higher level goals. And we're wanting to ensure that our plans and infrastructure and activities that we're supporting are in service to those broader objectives, absolutely. Um, I think that um, the, the level of um, planning and detail around the marine access review is quite tactical and quite oriented to the specific like um, proposed infrastructure and needs as opposed to that sort of higher level conversation around um, you know what kinds of facilities are we um, are we supporting over others or uses and activities um, that yeah that's my best uh, my best response at this time thanks I think that's a fulsome response and I'd also just add I think that's a council decision and when it comes to budget is how you want to allocate our budget dollars and there is a request from staff to start completing a cost plan for short-term community land leasing and licensing for the interim boat launch. I think it's very difficult to say that you're going to have a boat launch that's only going to be available to non-motorized. Um, you can shape it that way. I think you can maybe design it in some ways that would limit the size of the boats that could access it. But um, I think that's a council decision as to whether that's something that you want to put money towards in the budget. Um, I have Mayor Herford, then Councillor Green, and then myself on the list, and we can go back around. Thank you. I'd like to get to the, um, uh, sorry, I just want to get to make sure I'm on the right page of my agenda before I, so on the short term, the recommendation around the um, sort of the current, the current state of the, or improving the current state of the boat of our or the state of the current boat launch, I guess is maybe the best way to say that. Um, the I had a couple of questions. Just one of the on the map um, provided, which was on page one hundred one of our of our agenda or thirty two of the report. If anyone wants to look at it, um, it says it describes the area directly across Loggers Lane as informal vehicle slash trailer parking, private land, and some abandoned boats, and then the area around the yacht club limited informal and unmanaged parking for marina use and i just wondered um what the restriction was around those um those properties that are being used for the um around the yacht club those other the other pieces um and if there were any leases in place was it un informal uh, and unmanaged in the way that's not delineated or just in general or like what what, what do you mean by by that i, I understand the the um the piece that is directly across from the the um the boat launch but those other pieces what are the statuses of those and how um what other considerations are there besides what we're seeing 
Thanks for the question. Through to Olive Council, uh, the area, the parking areas that are uh, closely connected to the uh, government wharf and small craft. Craft Harbor in front of the Squamish Yacht Club building and so on. It's it's a bit of a um, it's an interesting set of uh, of lot, legal lot lines. There is some municipal road right of way. Uh, there's some municipal um, uh, land. So we do have an agreement with Squamish Yacht Club uh, for use of. Um, or for parking. Uh, also with the landowner um, to the north of Vancouver Street, I understand that the Yacht Club also has an arrangement uh, for some parking. Uh, but right now, um, beyond kind of those um, arrangements, there's nothing formal in terms of management, designated area, signage. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on the, those areas right now um, in terms of uh, sort of overflow with launching and then other um, users in the vicinity. Um, so it's very congested. And so we've highlighted, or it, the community has really highlighted that it's a challenge there um, in terms of finding parking. And, and it's all at the um, at this discretion of the of the upland owner as well, who's um, you know, allowing for that that parking and that use um, beyond the municipal uh, road right of way areas. So um, yeah, it's it's definitely um, something that we want to uh, try and help support and bring some um, more organization and support around. Also just fire lane access uh, to the wharf uh, for public safety, uh, for MSAR uh, in terms of their uh, call outs and being able to get easily um, to the dock and the wharf. If there's people parked in the fire lane on Vancouver Street or, or along in front of the dock, it gets really tricky. So even from just a public safety perspective and making sure that um, uh, there's um, adequate space for uh, emergency access as well. That's a, another goal. Thank you. Um, and I should have started by thanking you for this report. It was so in depth and uh, I think did a really, really good job of reflecting the community feedback. And there was the word, sort of the word bubbles that I don't think um, we shied away from, uh, <laughs> from pulling out the pieces that, um, you know, that were critical of the current uh, extremely critical and rightly so of the current situation. So um, I, I think this is a great piece to base our sort of next steps on. And so thank you so much for that. But it, having said that, a lot of the um, the feedback was also around, yes, we had upland parking, which is a piece that seems to be highlighted in the next step, but the, the ramp itself uh, and um, maintenance of the, the the real safety concerns around once a boat is launched it's just kind of floating there there's nowhere to put it safely while you go and go and park and all, all those cons considerations and um i i can see that we don't want to you know there'll be a limit of of um you know realistic investment that we could make in this in this area given that it's an interim solution but there's some very real safety concerns there so do you do you have um, the proposal seems to be mainly focused on the land piece? Is there anything in the water piece that, um, or that interface piece? I guess this is what this is all about. That um, that you may look to include, given the space and all the various constraints we have there. Thank you for the question. Um, absolutely, there's um, in water. Uh, improvements that the community has highlighted for us. And also there's a lot of erosion that's happening over time. Um, and because we're seeing a lot more use and also the variety of use and barge activity, and um, it's very tricky in there. Um, so we haven't recommended, um, uh, we've highlighted some of the specific in water um, uh, improvements that the community uh, has pointed to and that you um, will typically see uh, in a launch facility, like a boarding float and kind of shoring up the sides. Um, but also uh, there's been a lot of erosion kind of at the toe of the ramp as well over time. Um, that's certainly something that we would uh, discuss with um, uh, with the community and, uh, with upland owners, but it, again, it kind of comes back to that, um, management piece and before investing in a facility like that, I think we need to grapple with the larger qu question of, um, you know, are we going to play a role? And so we are looking for council, um, input around that idea because, 
uh, as mentioned um, in the Marine Access Review, uh, community launch facilities, a lot of them are very much integrated within a park system um, and uh, and um, infrastructure that a municipality in some cases um, uh, supports and, and facilitates. So that's a, a crux question for the district in terms of whether we are at a place where we want to play more of a role in that to help support marine access um, and working to see if there's um, opportunity with the current land owners um, within that vicinity to come together to figure something out. Um, but there's also at the same time, we're looking at these other um, possible locations for the longer term, um, but we need to do some more costing around that uh, before going too much further and then to gauge whether there's an appetite um, around the council table to help support um, in that area as well. So looking forward to, to council's input around this high level as well. Thank you. I think, you know, it's a multi-part equation and the one is uh, with what we have deteriorated, eroded, all the rest of it, how, what's the best action to improve its, um, its, its operation and with our financial constraints. And I see that upland piece and the parking as being that, but I just, I wonder where that, where that line is as far as investing in the, the ramp itself and those other pieces we just, we've just been discussing, um, at that location, um, given that they're this may not be the, the, the be all end all. And I think that, um, you know, I appreciated the, uh, was it the Squamish times or whatever the, the clipping from back in when this, uh, launched, um, you know, it was, um, it was great to see the, uh, see it as a community amenity, but I don't want to, you know, a lot, of, a lot of times we have these stopgap measures that end up being the solution for a dec decade plus. And I want to make, just be very cautious around around that piece of it so i do think that the parking thing is is great and i would like to do more to improve the the access but i'm a little concerned about taking on um an appropriate amount given the the less than ideal siting and all the other issues that are that are there currently so um however if we're formalizing things and it you know we may sort of inherit some of those um needing to address some of those, some of those issues. Um, but I'd like to understand the timeline and how far of a gap we're, we're bridging, um, uh, before taking on that deeper, that deeper step. So I see it as a multi-step piece and the upland being rightfully the first, the first step and then, um, assessing, assessing from there. Am I right to say that was comment now? Am I right to say, to say that the, um, um, that the parking piece and get that upland piece done will um, provide some space to then better define what that gap is. We'd be looking to bridge between a final, uh, a, a larger solution and the the improved um, solution that we that we have. Is that kind of what you're thinking? Uh, through to council, that yeah, helping to support. Um, some solutions around the upland parking does help to bridge, I think, um, and relieves some of the, the struggle around the congestion and safety on the truck route and uh, like within the community at that in that area. Um, uh, but I, I totally understand that the question around like how in terms of the stopgap, how long, um, how much does that help support and then ultimately for the, um, the pieces that are the improvement um, to the actual facility within the water, like what are the costs there? What are we getting ourselves in? You know, what would we be getting ourselves into? I think there's also some bigger discussion um, around um, financing and um, user pay. Uh, a lot of launches uh, have a you know pay for parking or a part uh, launch pass. Um, so there's ways that. Um, communities actually help to fund uh, improvements to those facilities over time. So that's also something that needs to be contemplated and looked at um, for not just for like this interim situation, but also more longer term if we were to contemplate um, such a facility as part of our parks network. And that's some of the discussion that needs to happen also with the Parks and Rec um, master plan update um, as well. Okay, thank you for that. And the Parks and Rec Master Plan update is where you think that that fee piece should um, lives rightfully. 
I definitely think we can uh, look at that in more detail as part of the Parks and Rec Master Plan, but I think there's more tactical discussion that we're trying to have in advance of that as well. So it's it's kind of happening um, uh, in, in both spheres, both in the marine access work in advance of the Parks and Rec Plan update, but also we would want to contemplate that for the longer term uh, within that bigger plan as well. Okay, thank you. And um, as as much as I uh, I just mentioned, I don't want to go too far with the the ramp and in water and all those those commitments at at this point in time. I also want to be clear that just fixing the upland or or not fixing, just positively impacting the upland uh, parking usage um, doesn't re is I'm very clear that doesn't resolve the uh, you know the entirety of the issues there. But it's a you know, a step that we can take um, right now, but there's just what that next step is. I wanna make sure that we don't commit to that um, without um, clear intention that that's what we wanna do. I don't wanna just inherit, a, you know, a, a next, uh, a required next step um, without the that appropriate um, attention to uh, intentionally doing that or not, you know? Councilor Greenlaw. Thanks, uh, through the chair. Thank you so much for this report. It was very informative and, and quite thorough. Um, I have a bit of a tangential question and then a mostly a comment. Um, is there any concern about the access to the current boat launch given that it's adjoining Marina, which if I'm not mistaken owns the property <laughs> that the boat launch is on is, is currently up for sale? Uh, just for clarity, the current boat launch uh, is on the on an, a private upland, and then in the water it descends into the federal small craft harbor, uh, in front of the the private sort of upland, which is a little bit awkward, and I'm not sure exactly how that worked. There was no um, sort of broader. Um, sort of federal kind of upland area, but anyway, that makes it a little bit tricky. So. Um, uh, users that come down in from the boat launch go in like tr trans transit through the federal water lot um, and because of it's a very limited area it's can be very congested and there's no infrastructure that's um, connected to the boat launch within the the um, small craft harbor so people launch their boat and then have to sort of run down or jump on um, jump on the side of the boat uh, uh, on the side of the channel or uh, get down onto the wharf and try and um, board their boat that way. It's it's a little bit tricky for sure. Okay, um, so the fact that the marina is up for sale is not, n not a huge concern? Um, I'm not sure I'm, I know which marina you're speaking about. You could clarify. Okay, I'll just go to my comment for now and then we'll I'll circle back to that one. But um, in general, in this conversation, to my mind, what we're talking about are two distinct sets of needs, right? Like we have motorized and non-motorized needs. Um, and I think we need to have access, uh, have easily accessible, infrastructurally light kind of thing, access for non-motorized vessels. And I believe there's intentions, at least intentions for this in Red Ridge Oceanfront and Waterfront developments, as well as the existing boat ramp. Yeah, that's approximately accurate. Uh, can you just clarify, so you're asking about whether non-motorized launching is part of the um, those plans within all of the waterfront parks that are contemplated? Yeah, like SUPs and kayaks and canoes and stuff like that, like really easy to get in and out of the water, you know? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, by, um, for most of those uh, waterfront parks, uh, non-motorized launching is um, being contemplated and planned for. Some of them have more distinct facilities than others um, in... Um, out at the oceanfront, you've got the two, um, there's the large kind of main public beach area um, between the headlands uh, that would allow for launching there just from the, a beach launch. Um, whereas over at Sea and Sky on the east side of Memquimbline Channel, uh, there will be uh, the waterfront village, um, basically a float uh, where there's a canoe and kayak launching from a float uh, at Wunayak Park, which is um, on the west side of the channel. We're designing uh, a public float uh, where people can walk down a gangway, a large gangway, uh, with their canoes or kayaks. And similarly at Winnipeg Street, the current float there now allows for launching uh, there. And there's also um, um, a opportunity to... Um, 
there's almost like an easy launch um, facility that's also part of that um, where you can bring your kayak down and there's sort of bars. I don't know if you've seen it um, at the Winnipeg float. Definitely your next lunch hour, walk down to the Winnipeg float and you'll see uh, the, the kayak launch there as well. Okay, thanks. And then for the motorized vehicles, it seems to me that if we also want to have a functional um, launch for motorized, you know, as well as non-motorized, but usable for motorized vessels that will serve our community for some time, allowing for sufficient parking, trailer parking, facilities with running water and washrooms, uh, it seems to me like the only realistic place to do that would be Daryl Bay in terms of space. Um, so that's the comment I have. I'm going to dig up more stuff about this marina and then I'll talk to you about it. Thanks. Thank you for the comment. I have a few questions myself and then uh, we can go back around. Um, so the first one is on that marine access inventory table that's in the report, Ms. McJanet. Um, one of the columns is equipment storage um, and it identifies a few of the areas where there's expected to be equipment storage. And I'm just curious if you, if we have any clarity on what that looks like, like who's going to own that equipment storage? Is that going to be accessible to the community broadly? Is that something that becomes district property? And then we manage through our recreation program and you get like annual access to like, how do we have, have we thought through what that looks like? Thanks for the question. Yeah. Equipment storage is a, is a real need. Uh, and it also helps support people, um, uh, especially if they're living in downtown, they don't have, or in other places and they don't have a lot of space for their storage, having equipment storage close to marine access sites, um, enables, um, that easy access. It also enables folks to bike or take the bus there or walk and then have facilities. It might be their own, um, storage, um, their own personal watercraft, or it might be rental or, a in terms of a club, um, a great example is Squamish paddling, paddling club that has a storage facility close to the water, uh, at Winneak park. And they have, um, both club watercraft for people to use, but also allows for personal storage as well. Um, so, um, some of that storage could be connected to, um, a water, um, or like a, a organization like uh, dragon boat or, um, uh, paddle club or Squamish wind sports society also has storage out at, uh, spit Island, uh, for, for their members use. Uh, but it also could be more public storage as also, um, not all of it necessarily needs to be enclosed. Uh, some of it are like kayak racks or things that you can, um, lock your, uh, equipment to, um, that are sort of, uh, open. Um, so lots of different varieties of storage, but definitely, uh, essential, uh, to plan for space for storage. Okay. That's helpful. Um, I was a little bit disappointed to see that on the non-motorized users, one of the top spots wasn't the end of Winnipeg street yet, but hopefully more people are starting to identify that they can put their non-motorized uh, kayaks and battle boards in at the float there. Um, my other question was around the recommendation on coordinated parking provision and demand management measures. And I see the need for this definitely. Um, I'm curious how it ties into our broader downtown parking strategy and, um, the study that's currently going on, um, and how we're actually thinking about parking demand more broadly and in mostly from a, from a staffing perspective and the systems that we might use to actually on a fee for service basis, collect parking fees, for example, and how do we integrate that into the broader parking strategy or is that not quite there yet? Thanks for the question. It's not quite there yet, but we have flagged it uh, for integration in a broader parking strategy and highlighting specific um, marine access parking um, needs, essentially. Um, this has been playing out certainly as we've been looking in uh, at making some interim changes for the Wuneak Street and parking lot uh, next to Wuneak Park. Uh, so it Previously, there was no um, timed parking uh, within that lot, and then it was filling up all day, and then marine users were not able to uh, to really access that facility and the, the beach launch there, which is really tricky. Uh, so we actually made a shift um, 
uh, to institute three hour parking, as well as uh, we signed a number of temporary boat drop and pickup uh, stalls within that parking lot. Um, and we're working with the Squamish Paddling Club around like a um, kind of some parking passes because um, they have a license over part of that um, for the the paddle club. Um, so if there, there are folks doing like a longer paddle session um, or um, training or that kind of thing, then they can, um, there's sort of like a day parking pass essentially. So we're, we're starting to look at those types of um, demand management to ensure that there is parking available as well as temporary drop-off uh, spaces because you've got folks with big boats and kayaks and they're trying to get them like into the water. So uh, those are essential. So we'll look at that more closely in terms of like um, integrating that longer term within our parking strategies for downtown as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, my other question is around the Oceanfront Sailing Center and just trying to get some clarity on what will actually be delivered through the Sailing Center. Um, this, this table is helpful, but I, I'm still not entirely clear about what the sailing center is going to bring to the table. Um, and just curious if, you, if we have that defined or if that's work that's still forthcoming. Thanks for the question. Through to all of council, the sailing center amenity and facility, it's still uh, under development. The, um, the crux core pieces for that sailing center are outlined in the phase development agreement for the ocean front in terms of um, those components to be delivered through the project. Um, certainly, uh, we've been uh, engaged in early days um, and uh, we'll look forward to more engagement with the, um, the nonprofit group that's kind of envisioning and pulling together the program for that uh, site and facility. Um, and a lot of that coordination is that where we've been engaged is through, uh, with Matthews West. Um, uh, we understand though that in terms of the vision, we've been uh, we've posed questions just around, is there opportunity for uh, shared use and space um, for also for uh, canoe, kayak, uh, and other kind of launch uh, um, amenity there, um, just so that we have a, an understanding uh, as we go around what's envisioned there. So um, we understand uh, from the engagement that we did for this, uh, that it, they're kind of envisioning a bit of like a Jericho Sailing Center type um, facility. So. Yeah, we will continue to work with them around that to make sure that um, we can um, uh, get uh, maximize uh, the opportunities there for the community. Okay, great. Um, and then just trying to clarify the role of local government here in supporting and facilitating the discussion around the short term needs at the existing boat launch um, and what the expectations might be for the district. So I appreciate there, there needs to be some support in terms of kind of coordinating and facilitating the discussion. Is the expectation that the district would then be potentially the like head leasee on a sublease and would manage that? Or is that still just kind of to be determined at this point or you're looking for council feedback? Thank you for the question. Absolutely looking for council feedback here. Um, Back in April of last year, we also highlighted um, some of the, the crux challenges here and the notion that um, like a community license uh, is one could be one opportunity to try and um, secure basically some parking area and then also um, be able to help support with uh, enforcement of parking and putting up some signage and things like that. So there is some cost there for sure. Also, there's... Um, uh, like old trailers and removal and it's it's not unlike our role that we played um with the navigation channel creation where we worked with upland owners um in the channel to remove the pilings uh, and play a role to facilitate and help support um, um kind of cleanup uh of the waterway and helping to facilitate um access and in that case it was about removing derelict vessels within the channel in this um, in this context, it's more helping to support and secure um, area for parking and safe circulation in the vicinity of the of the boat launch. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, two more quick questions um, on the list of recommendations that are in the draft report for discussion. I think one of the challenges that I had is that there are a lot of them. A lot of them seem really important, um, and I know that we're not going to be able to do them all at once. Um, so one of the things that I was reflecting on was. Uh, the 
report that came from the Food Policy Council that highlighted who was responsible for what actions in kind of a short to medium time frame. And I wonder if that would be appropriate for these recommendations that you've presented here. Um, and just wondering your feedback on that one. Uh, thank you for that suggestion um, through to council. Yeah, I think that's a great way to sort of highlight the different um, the different actions or recommendations who would be a lead. Is, is it a lead role? Is it a supporting role? And then what is the relative priority around? Um, is that like uh, short term within the next you know two years? Is it more of a midterm item or a longer term item? So um, that's great uh, suggestion and I'll bring that into the final document uh, development. Okay, great. And then my last question was around uh, the suggestion that Dale Bay might be a continued good uh, area to pursue at the very least. Um, and we had a discussion earlier this morning around UBCM minister meetings. I'm just curious from your perspective if that would be a helpful topic to bring up at the ministerial level at this point, um, or if staff discussions uh, seem more or seem sufficient. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, at this time, uh, I think staff. Uh, discussion. Uh, it's been at that level for the Marine uh, zoning review and then this Marine access review, but uh, we can definitely follow up with council uh, if, if it seems like there's an opportunity for um, a higher level discussion around that as well. Thank you for the comment. Great. Thank you. All right, council, looking at the clock, we have about 10 minutes left on our agenda for this and Ms. McJana is still looking for feedback. So we'll do a round the table. Um, uh with comments at this point uh if you have any really dire clarifying questions you can also ask them but we'll try and keep them to comments on the recommendations and the implementation items uh unless you feel very strongly about putting forward a different motion than what's recommended in the agenda package uh, i will start with councillor pettingill and then go to his right so councillor anderson you're next in line Okay, thanks. Um, so in general, um, supportive of the recommendations, I, I will highlight, I, I do think, uh, and whether this requires additional budget or we can do some of it within what we have here, um, I am sort of looking for, and I know you, Ms. McJenna, have been very involved in some of the biosphere work and, and the overall health of the sound. And so just looking for some connection to how we are, um, uh, supporting that with the decisions we're making here would be really valuable for me uh just coming in this morning by the rail bridge which i guess we zoned that area as m1 i saw a beautiful big blue heron so i've been thinking in my mind about what are the impacts even non-motorized impacts there if there's a lot a whole crowd of people that's going to have impact so i just want to be somehow highlight in the discussions like the the paper has a lot of what people would like and it seems like they're thinking of the activity i want to do right now but not the other piece of so what are the impacts of these activities and and so i think that's important to to have at the front of our minds and in in the the further discussions we're having um and so that goes to the responsible recreating and marine areas and hubs uh i think there's an opportunity there it talks about safety and some of the the navigational roles and so on but maybe information about the biosphere impacts on ecosystems and so on people are not doing the the drag nets or whatever uh, just some of that awareness, I think there's good opportunity. And then with the marine sector needs study and the marine commercial use management, again, with the choices we are going to make there, and whether it's fees, whether it's, you know, the design of facilities, um, all these sorts of things, what are the impacts we're going to have? And I understand the marine sector needs study is partly meant to answer some of these questions, but that seems very uh, economic focused, and there are some really good things to look into there in alignment with our, our um, green tech, rec tech, tourism uh, target sectors. Uh, but what are some of the impacts of the different choices on the sound, on the, the broader uh, world? Uh, I think that needs to be uh, very much part of these discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pangill. Councillor Anderson. Firstly, with respect to the concept of a marine light industrial area between Vancouver and Westminster streets, blocks 45 and 46, this was, has been proposed in every single district produced plan between 1992 and 2003. 
And it's the an oceanfront subarea plan was an anomaly in relocating it down the southwest corner. But the, all of these plans are still available, uh, presumably. But uh, I, I suggest then, yes, revisiting blocks 45 and 46A and these former plans is to be recommended. Also, Daryl Bay for boat launch investment, uh, further investigation. With respect to the two sub-area plans that we have on the waterfront, the waterfront landing, sea to sea and sky, and the ocean front. The waterfront landing sub-area plan, the original one, had marine light industry heavily emphasized. And that was removed in 2017, and there was some discussion around that, not least at the Squamish Estuary Management Committee, because of the pressures that the new owners, uh, their recommendation would, would result in, we're, hit, we're visiting it today. It was the forest industry that was concerned that we're going to end up having to deal with your demands on Site B. That came up during the waterfront landing uh, sub area plan amendment in 2017. Uh, to cite the, from the report on page five, from a parks and recreation perspective, these pub sub area plans greatly contribute to the accessibility of the waterfront and the community's overall connection with House Sound. Yes, but they don't contribute to the marine working harbor perspective or from that perspective or the recreational boating infrastructure perspective and we need to highlight both of these both aspects both perspectives on water access and we shouldn't lose sight of it we need to be explicitly highlighting both sets of needs now whether a to quote from the report a separate commercial industrial facility is needed is recommended for the scope of the 24 2024 marine impact study i suggest yes that's a good idea uh, however, um, I, we should perhaps have that marine impact study terms of reference come back to Council. It looks like there's lots of interesting questions that are coming up. And I suggest that the oceanfront sub-area plan needing to be revised, apparently, should also be a topic coming back to Council or in one way or another addressed and discussed in the near future. And I think that the owners would welcome this. With respect to Site B, to quote from the report, Site B is recognized as an important site for port functions and regional access for the forest industry and favorable for port facilities and related uses, various phrasing in the report. In fact, it's the only site left for these functions. This was recognized in the 2011 Squamish Nation District of Squamish Accord. The present picture may be misleading of underutilized land at Site B. The region has 800,000 cubic meters of annual level cut, 66% held by First Nations, and they are clearly stakeholders in Site B. And we should look at the longer picture and the present market and policy conditions is short term. Look at the long picture. Uh, so there's reference to an evolving and modern vision for Site B, unquote. What comes to mind for me is that there's no servicing there, no safe highway re-entry, a major issue, no safe railroad crossing, and no legal address. So Site B is in a rather a raw state in relative terms. That's what comes to me about modernizing it. Um, so the investigation of recreational boating infrastructure development at Site B on the part of the district, in my view, should await the proposed marine impact study, and it should await a forest industry land strategy, which First Nations forestry business arms have themselves been advocating for a number of years. I, the issue of joint planning of Site B has been proposed by the District Council resolution since 2005. Time we get on it, but let's be ready for it rather than jump in and, and uh, I, I, we should be ready for it finally because we have delayed on that a long standing recommendation to work together with the Squamish Nation. Uh, with respect to engagement for the future for this marine access review, there's reference to shared leadership and shared leadership in connection with education, enforcement, and compliance. However, we also need shared leadership in getting along in land use. And this was the particular function of the Estuary Management Committee, in fact, still is. It's where different uses can understand their needs to resolve a long-term, avoiding long-term conflict, recreation, industry, residential, 
It's a way for different stakeholders, conservation industry, to find security and to explain their security needs. So shared leadership, my point here, is more than education, enforcement, and compliance. It's shared leadership in land use and understanding each other's land use needs. I'll leave it at that, Chair. Uh, except for one thing, let's not overlook ferries and their particular needs. Uh, we just we shouldn't overlook it. It may come up from some proponent, but we should be ready. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Greenlaw, go ahead. Thanks. Um, just to clarify my previous comments, the marina for sale is further up the blind channel, so I apologize for any confusion. Um, I want to thank you again for the thorough report. Uh, the recommendations show an in-depth consideration of our needs, uh, and I appreciate the clear focus on stewardship and accessibility in a number of the recommendations. As with all things Squamish, parking will be, is, and will be an important consideration in the conversation, and I appreciate the, the level of attention it's receiving. Um, yeah, I look forward to this resulting in a suitable boat launch, among other things that we'll be, we will enjoy for years to come. So thank you. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor who next? Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. Um, and I'll, I'll add um, my name to the list of councillors thanking staff. It's impressive to me that um, we have staff members who can go from on one day being experts on child care to the next day being experts on all things marine. There's not a lot of uh, synergy between those two things. And yet, um, here we are today talking about marine uh, and a few weeks ago talking about child care. So uh, thanks to staff for the good work. Um, so right off the top, um, I'm a strong no to recreational boat launching um, and any interaction at Site B. I just don't see a good mix there between the heavy industry and the forestry work that takes place at Site B and recreational boaters. Um, I'm glad that um, Site B has, has been identified and, and looked at as a potential site. And then I'm left with the feeling that it's not a good mix and I don't wish to pursue any kind of um, work on our recreational boat launch at Site B. Uh, definitely yes to further study of Daryl Bay for recreational vessel launch and access point. Uh, and definitely yes to looking carefully at future water access and infrastructure at lots 45, 46 um, in the downtown area. I love this idea of marine adventure hubs, uh, similar to what we see serving our mountain bike community further inland. Uh, I, I see great success with a program um, like that. Uh, yes to temporary improvements at the current uh, downtown boat launch. And I'm thinking specifically some kind of temporary um, float dock to improve boat launch safety and efficient launching at that site. Uh, and then further to that, I think that one of the things that uh, we're, we're missing in the discussion so far on uh, launching vessels and pulling them out of the water is a travel lift system or a crane system. Um, one of our more avid boating community members who's with us today has pointed uh, to this as a potential solution that is quite different from uh, a boat launch. And I think that's something that um, we need to give some consideration to in the future. And then uh, my final two, the question of um, parks and recreation department involvement, a uh, big yes to that. And I think that pay parking is inevitable for um, um, storing uh, trailers, uh, that are associated uh, with any boat launch facilities that we create in the future. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor French. We'll go to Councillor Hamilton and then Mayor Herford. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and yes, thanks very much to staff for all the work on this. Um, I think I would like to, so the, my earlier comment about wind sports, um, thank you, Councillor Stoner for pointing out that uh, that was mentioned in the WMA. Um, I think it's, I think it would be important to mention possibilities outside 
uh, so wind sports solutions access to um, Papahema Island outside of the WMA, I think is important to mention within the report. Um, and broadly speaking on the boat launch side of things, um, I am generally supportive of a temporary solution um, near the at the current site um, with exploring long-term solutions at Darrell Bay seem to me to be the most effective way forward uh, from this report, but I know that's not the decision we're making at this point. So thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Mayor Hufford, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for all the work on this. I've said it, I've said it before, but it really is um, a remarkable piece of work and uh, does a good job of painting the um, the both the challenges and the opportunities and the tremendous amount of work we all have to do. So I do support the, um, I think it was Councillor Stoner's um, suggestion around the really articulating the the sort of the phasing, the the relative priority and, and timeline of of the actions to, I think that would be be helpful. Um, the Marine Adventure Hubs, I think is a great, um, uh, a great concept and we do have, um, we will have a lot more access for our um, as uh, Sea and Sky comes online and the waterfront park uh, next next summer. So I think giving some thought into how we sort of uh, pull people there rather than push people there um, it, to those places um, where there is uh, water access for their um, non motorized um, um, activities. I think that would uh, go a long way in in um, in sort of spreading out that load and not point loading it on their our um, currently sort of what's viewed anyways as our one access point, although there are other, there are others. And so I think that's um, a great piece and will hopefully manage some of that demand going forward. Um, the 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 sort of the interim solutions at the boat launch, I think, um, are great steps. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, the in water stuff, uh, um, investments, I guess, are um, are something that I think we'll be really need to be careful of. Get, I do recognize that some things like a floating, uh, I'm sorry, I forget the, the technical term for the, the side float to, um, you know, those can be repurposed. Like they, float, they float, they move, they're mobile. And that's, you know, and I think some, um, you know, that's uh, things that should be should be considered, but just being careful of, the, of sort of the scope creep of that um, investments in that in that facility till we clearly know how long we're uh, of a gap we're looking to uh, to bridge with uh, with that um, facility. Um, I think the site B discussion, as outlined um, in the report, actually says um, invitation and meaningful opportunities to engage with Squamish Nation and their development corporation in Chikai on marine access at site B industrial site. This isn't, I think absolutely that's that's something that should be done. So we understand uh, the ambitions of, uh, of of the nation and what, uh, what role um, th that can play in our overall marine marine access recreation or or otherwise. And um, and I think is absolutely worth um, worth exploring. And as to how compatible um, the vision is uh, with what's happening there, that's that's a conversation we'd be participating in, not driving. And I think it's absolutely important that we show up to have that conversation with uh, with our our partners at the at the nation. So um, I, I'm very supportive of exploring that and understanding what those. Um, um, yeah, what those aspirations are and how that fits together in the broader um, sense of uh, of the community. So I, I'm supportive of that. I'm not I'm agnostic as to the outcome, but we need to be there having those conversations and see where there is alignment and how that plays into our overall, um, their future facility planning can play into our overall um, community needs uh, assessment. So I think it's I think it's absolutely important we show show up there and have those have those conversations. Um, so I, I'm I'm curious to see when this uh, does come back and the actual um, budgeting piece. And we didn't touch on the flood protection, and I'm curious how that all sort of fits fits together. Um, so uh, I, and I I'm I hope I'm correct in assuming that that's uh, will be a piece that comes back at at budget, and we can sort of flush out the that um, sort of all the layers of, of that at that point. So I'm going to leave it there for now. So thank you so much.
Thank you. Uh, my comments on this reflect many that have already been stated around the table. Uh, generally very supportive of the draft of it as it as it is. Um, as I mentioned, I think some phasing of the recommendations would be really helpful just to set both uh, mostly expectation with council on how much budget you might need to move this forward on what timeline, uh, but also with the community and understanding who are other uh, collaborators and agencies are on some of these items. So definitely the responsible recreating guide, I would anticipate that hopefully tourism and Squamish would be able to help with that. Um, I love the idea of the marine adventure hubs uh, to what Mayor Herford was saying, being able to pull, especially the non-motorized recreation recreators to really designated areas um, that have some support there for them to be able to get in and out uh, on uh, easier access where we don't have folks that are scrambling over sensitive habitat, either at the upper reaches of the Mamcom blind channel at high tide or off the edge of the wildlife management areas uh, would be really fantastic. I think uh, to Councillor Pettingill's point, really elevating um, the introduction in this report is really great about the, the values and identifying the UNESCO biosphere region and, and the values of the Squamish nation in particular, uh, recognizing the environmental values, but really how we start to integrate that into some of the recommendations and the trade-offs that we're making uh, in our list of wants, uh, I think it is important. Um, with respect to the boat launch, as I see it, I think I think the best solution is still not clear to me, um, at least the long-term solution. And so in general, I am supportive of trying to support some of the interim solutions at the existing region where we can. And so if that's some staff time to help figure out what the upper land ownership is and how we might be able to get a, a sublease and whether that sublease is best sitting with the district or some other sort of community entity. I think my perspective in that conversation is that I would want it to be as close to cost neutral as possible at the end of the day. And so I'm not willing to put necessarily, I'll put some money up front, but I don't want to put ongoing money into that budget item. Um, and I'll be very clear about that today. Uh, but happy to put some staff time into supporting that conversation, figuring out how we get there um, so that we can bridge to what that longer term solution is. I also think one of the dangers in doing that um, is that there's expectation that that boat launch remains downtown in the long term. And I have a really hard time thinking that that's where we're going to put 0.8 hectare, is it hectares plus uh, of downtown area for boat launching and trailering is really hard for me to imagine. Um, so I think exploring all those other options, Daryl Bay in particular rises to the top for me um, for, for a longer term solution is definitely something that I'm interested in continuing the conversations, especially with uh, the province. And if Wood Fiber is listening, they are always welcome to come to the table sooner rather than later. We've been beating that drum for a while. Um, and uh, I had one other point to make. Oh yeah, the clarification of, and I think this initial table is super helpful in starting to communicate about what is coming with various developments. And I think that that's the real tension point where we're at right now is that we don't really fully understand, our community doesn't really fully understand what has been committed by some of these developments. Um, I think things like the sailing center is one example where even we're a little, a little bit fuzzy on what the end product is going to be. And so whatever we can do to further communicate that will be really helpful um, because there are going to be a few challenging years here, I think, before we get to the desired end goal. But I think even just seeing that map of like, oh, here's what we currently have and here's what the future is going to look like uh, was really helpful for me to see. So I think wherever we can put that out uh, will be really great for our community. Um, with that, I will just check in with staff and see if there was anything that you need clarity on or anything that you heard that was uh, can maybe opposing ideas around the table that you might seek clarity on. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Everyone did an amazing job being very clear <laughs> with, um, with your comments uh, and your um, suggestions. So I have a really solid uh, understanding. I don't I don't sense or feel that there's kind of like opposing uh, pieces that are needing a little bit more uh, clarity. I think when we bring back, um, well, there's more engagement to happen over the summer. And I think with some of, with the feedback that's pr been provided today, we'll be able to do a little bit more deep diving and hopefully get more certainty and um, uh, 
address the fuzzies <laughs> and uh, provide a little bit more clarity around these items. So thank you. We're Great. good. Great. Uh, I did have one other quick comment about Site B and just wanting to recognize that that is definitely under a Squamish Nation led land and marine use plan. And so I think it's important that we be ready to participate in that conversation when they do outreach. But um, at the end of the day, it is their vision that's going to drive what happens at Site B. And so how we can be there to support um, is important in the long run. Uh, I think I saw your hand, Mayor. Go ahead. I was going to move. Um receipt of the um, Squamish Marine Access Review Discussion Draft Document and Boat Launching Situational Analysis, um, and that uh, the Digital Squamish provide feedback on the draft recommendations, implementation items presented here um, as discussed in this meeting. Do you also want to move the third bullet point? It was just feeling long-winded, but yes, I will also move the third uh, long, uh, the third um, point that the district Columbus direct staff to solicit final comment from the community on the marine access review discussion draft prior to bringing it back to council for final endorsement. So moved by Mayor Herford, seconded by Councillor French. Any further comments at this point? Councillor Pettingill, go ahead. Yeah, just add in maybe a point of clarification for me. I, I am also supportive of putting some funds into existing the existing boat launch interim solutions. Just want to be really careful of. Uh, the impacts of that. So if we do some upgrades or do something and then it ends up uh, a private for-profit water taxi takes up 90% of the access and use, that wouldn't be a good outcome. So I don't know if that gets us into a realm where then we have all these extra things to manage and it's more cost and benefit. Uh, but you know, if we can find a way where we can improve access with what we've got in the interim, uh, I am open to some budget for that. Councillor French. Thanks, Chair. Um, and uh, just speaking in favor of the motion, I'll circle back to two thoughts that I had previously. I didn't mention Watts Point in my um, final comments, but I think that my thought that Watts Point maybe deserves a little bit more of a spotlight, as I mentioned earlier, got caught by staff. Uh, and my earlier comments on Site B were pretty strong, uh, and, and I want to temper that a little bit by adding that Squamish Nation actually, it absolutely uh, is the lead on that site. And if uh, the Squamish Nation uh, comes with a plan that's super solid, that includes recreational boating access, I could certainly um, get behind that with, uh, with some good solid planning and work. Councillor Anderson, I saw your hand. <laughs> With respect to the Squamish Nation driving what happens at Site B, of course, they are the owners of this property. However, the district retains land use designation and zoning prerogatives over these lands, and they do this by agreement with the Squamish Nation and by agreement with the province between the Squamish and Squamish Nation. The reason for this is that it reflects the regional and the provincial interest in this these critical port lands and lands critical for, for for the forest industry. Thank you. All right, I will call the question. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ms. McCann, Thank you, for the counsel. presentation and the discussion. We will take a 10 minute recess and come back at 3.15. All right, if folks could turn their video back on, we are live. We are back in committee of the whole on item three sub five. We have Mr. Bragg here for our Q2 2023 update on the real estate and facilities master plan and general projects update. I will turn it over to you, Mr. Bragg. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you, thank you for your time this afternoon. Uh, my name is Cal Bragg. I am the Director of Facilities Planning and Construction here at the district. Uh, this is the Q2 2022 uh, facilities and construction update. Uh, it updates works under the real estate facilities master plan um, and some other projects that we're working on. And that's for uh, yeah for Q2 for this year. Uh, this includes firewall number two, which over at Tantalus Road there, uh, public works facility, uh, Brennan Park Recreation Centre, um, uh, the fields and, and, and lands work, and there's sub projects within that one. Uh, it includes a civic block, which is the municipal offices and other projects there, including the business park, uh, covered structures, 
Valleycliff Child Care, Squamish Adventure Centre and the Junction Park Washrooms. And we'll also look at uh, the grants and sustainability update as well, what we're working on. So fire hall number two, it's on time, on budget. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen it. It's under construction right now. We're, uh, we're, we're going ahead with, in leaps and bounds. Um, we anticipated construction to finish in June. We've moved that forward now to May 2024. So we're, uh, we're right on time. Uh, the budget's 15.8. We're confident we'll hit that at this stage of the game, which is great. Um, and the works at the moment, we're doing concrete. Um, it's a concrete block. Um, it's built as post-disaster, so it's a very resilient building and it also holds the uh, possible building on top of it. So uh, there's a lot of concrete in this uh, in this project. Um, the next steps is to continue basically making the concrete boxes boxes we prepare to, uh, to put the roof on. Um, and we've also started the furnishing, fitting and equipment. Um, so we're getting down to the detail and, um, and really focusing on the end date here. The main hurdle that we've uh, anticipated or had to come across was cost escalation. Um, nothing's changed on the budget. We've moved some items around, so everything's tracking as per it should be. The public works facility staff are pausing at the moment. Um, we're reviewing the cost and timeline. The budget uh, we're working to is 37 million. We're trying to reduce that. Um, works at the moment is a real focus on on functionality budget and and redoing the planning um the existing work that we've done to date you'll see there's a big mound on site and uh, preloads ready to go so the next steps are to confirm the uh the budget we'll be coming back to council in july as a heads up we're imminent to come back to revise to to see where we're going here For the Brennan Park Fields and uh, Brennan Park Recreational Centre and the Fields and Lands work, uh, the pre-development work that was approved, I think it was April 4, earlier this year from council um, has started. We're on time on budget. Uh, the budget number is $300,000. And, uh, and just a note for this work. So what we've uh, shown here is a snapshot of where the architect's working on at the moment. Um, it's very much a preliminary, um, it's in preliminary at the moment. So where it says where the splash pad is, it's not exactly where it's going at the moment. The goalposts are moving. So all this is showing is that we've started the work and we're, um, and we're veering towards um, supporting um, the grant number one work. So the whole reason or the snapshot of this is what the architects have been doing um, is they've reviewed the prior studies under the fields and uh, lands master plan. Uh, they reviewed the feasibility studies from 2018. They've taken into account the public engagement on Brennan Park to date. Um, the previous engaged, the architect uh, layouts. Um, they've also been engaging with the um, district's planning department and recreational departments. And what they're doing is making sure that the grant number one renovation works or the stage one, which we're working on now, um, then fits in with the possibility if we do get the grant number two one and just basically laying the table for future works here. So literally this is just a snapshot of where we're sitting at the moment. So the next stage and the next planning here is we'll be tightening up the details of what we've got and then going out to the community for community engagement and community input. And this is over the next six months. And this is also in parallel with the splash pad works and the grant number one works as well. And there's been no hurdles so far in this one. I'm sorry, Mr. Bray. I'm just going to stop you there for a quick sec and just see uh, Councillor Hamilton. I just want to see if you're actually there, if you're back or not. Your video is not on just for minute taker sake. Assume he's not quite back yet and he'll turn his video on when he is. Sorry, continue. Continuing with Brennan Park. Uh, the stage one um, renovation work, which we're calling the uh, Green Inclusive Communities uh, Building Program. Sorry, I dig that academic credit, correct. Um, that's on time on budget. Um, we're anticipating, we've actually moved the construction start date from the end of this year to early next year. We're anticipating starting in January. The end date's still the same. Um, we need to finish the work before 2026 per the grant requirements. The work at the moment, uh, the IPD team, which is the integrated project delivery uh, team, uh, is being engaged. So we've got the architect, the builder, all the engineers, uh, mechanical, electrician and the plumber and everyone's on deck working hard to create the scope of work at the moment. Um, the next steps is to finalise that contract and actually get it signed. Um, community engagement is the next steps for the next six months here. And then also the validation report. Um, so I'm not sure if Mayor and Council remembered for um, fire hall number two, because it was an IPD project, we had a validation report. And what that report is, is that it's a very, very detailed report and it gets us to a class A or a class B um, 
budget number and scope of work very early on in the process compared to say a typical standard construction management uh, system. Um, and the team are working on that. Uh, we'll be getting that in Q4 this year. There's no hurdles at the moment other than we're renovating an old building. Um, there's a lot of things that come out of the uh, the walls there, so to speak, um, and it's very difficult to determine a 100% scope of work when you're doing renovation. So, um, yeah, this is not the team's first project that they've had to go through this on, so it's just taking time to get through it. Additional work on the Brennan Park fields and, um, and lands uh, work here. We've got the splash pad and the playground. And this one's on time on budget as well. The um, request for proposals is about to go out. Um, we're anticipating the design to be completed this year and then the construction to start next year. Um, at the moment, the master planning ties into that as well, where we've got a rough area where we think that the um, splash pad is going to go. We're going to wait until the proponent, who's the designer and the builder for the um, splash pad to come on, on board and get engaged. And we'll engage with them, also the community, the other consultants that we've got on board and obviously internal departments to then finalise where the, um, the next stages, the next steps are going to be for the splash pad and playground. For the dog park, we're on time on budget. We're about 90% complete on that project for this year. The pickleball courts uh, are on time on budget so far. Um, the district's done and is keeping the pickleball association engaged. Um, yeah, they're working closely with them at the moment. Um, the work that we've got is, again, we've got a request for a proposal for the actual construction of the pickleball courts. Uh, the district has created and finished the, um, the groundworks to set the stage to get the builder on board. We don't know where it's going to sit, if it's going to be four or six courts. Um, we anticipate it's going to be minimum four courts. If we can get additional budget and squeeze some more out of there, we're going to add to six courts. And again, the Pickleball Association has been involved and they've been updated almost on a weekly basis on, on, on the project. The Soccer Skills Bike Park is outside of the district's management. Um, they are managing it, but they're anticipating a completion date in, at the end of this year. The civic block, which includes the municipal office and the business park, um, we've just gone out for requests for proposals. This one's on time. We're anticipating the reports to come back from the consultant. District will be working with the proponents from now until uh, the end of the year, and we anticipate we'll be getting a report back. We could submit to council in Q1 next year, and it's around February. Um, as noted, uh, we're, we're about to engage a consultant and we've just gone out for, right into the marketplace. Uh, the next steps is to finish up the project charter, uh, engage this consultant, and then also further advance the existing partner opportunities. We're in discussion with a lot of partners at the moment. The covered structures, the eagle wind trees, they were trees that were added in here. We're just noting they're complete. It was a small job, but uh, shade will be created there very shortly. For the downtown structure, um, and we're calling this the number four structure at the farmer's market. This was a, um, a grant, it was, uh, the district applied for a grant last year. Um, it was through the Canada Healthy Communities um, Initiative and it was for $98,000. Um, the location of this one is at the farmer's market on Cleveland. Um, we're anticipating a construction start soon. We'd like to finish it this year. It's gonna be very similar to the one that we've got on Cleveland, um, the existing one at the moment. Um, staff have engaged with uh, two community groups already and the next stage for this one is to further that engagement um, and start schematic design and we're just about to go out for requests for uh, proposals as well on that one. The Valley Cliff Child Care Centre has been temporarily delayed. Um, the construction possible start would be Q1 2024. The budget is 2.5 million. It's been um, increased from 2 million due to uh, additional grant funding. Um, the hurdle that we've got at the moment is archaeological management. We've just come to some additional time that we need to work through. There's been some items that have been found on site um, and that's going to add between three to six months we anticipate at this stage of the game. The next stage is to revolve, resolve these um, uh, archaeological items, um, complete the detailed design and then push for a building approval. The Squamish Adventure Centre um, is complete, ninety-eight percent complete. I'd say um, it was complete on time, on budget. The tenants are occupying the building at the moment. Uh, the budget was around seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. We've had some additional work added onto that. Well, it's around. Um, we've got some deficiency work to finish up and one mill work item to get in there, but basically, it's uh, it's complete.
The Junction Park washrooms are delayed. The reason we've delayed the uh, the fit out of the washrooms here is because of budget. Um, we didn't get anything back from the market that was under budget and staff are reviewing a renovation of that at the moment to see what options we've got. So we'll come back to council in Q3 and, and then provide an update there. So that's the project update. Just a, uh, an overview on sustainability here. Um, for fire hall number two, we've gone for a net zero energy level, which is as high as you can basically get without creating energy. Um, we're aiming for a 90% reduction into um, the landfill. And a noted, this is a concrete framed building. Unfortunately, it uses a lot of carbon, but that's the way it goes um, when you're building a, a post uh, disaster building. The public works facilities under review will be coming back to council again, as noted in July, with the uh, sustainability proposed sustainability levels. Um, and Brennan Park Stage One again is another net zero energy uh, building. So we're uh, really pushing the boundaries on um, on sustainability here. The grants, uh, the approved grants is stage one. Um, the um, renovation works at Brennan Park for $16.3 million. Um, as noted before, the uh, the covered structure one for farmers market for $98,000 is approved and we're about to start working on that one. What staff have applied for is the Brennan Park uh, second grant. We're calling that the grant number two and it's $14 million. That work is not really adding any community um, projects or sorry, any items that enhance um, programming. It's more so focused on sustainability and we're anticipating an announcement any day now. Um, and the fire hall number two, we've got some additional funding coming through and that totals to about just over a million dollars roughly on those calculations. And again, we'll know it's due around now. And that's wrapped up in an overview, not sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bragg, uh, for the fulsome overview. I'll go to council for questions. Who'd like to kick us off? Go ahead, Councillor Anderson. Yes, uh, I'm referring to the Brennan Park Recreation Center section of the report, um, and a number of questions arise for me here. Uh, there's reference to uh, parking in the map, and I can um, my suggestion is that the concept of repurposing the south east west corner uh, for parking as indicated in the map is probably valid to pursue during for example the soccer fest uh, in pouring down weather every single parking spot from the rod and gun club to the logger sports north of the tennis courts and the grass all spoken for we do have probably parking issues to take in mind uh, you, your report does, Mr. Bragg, refer to a traffic consultant. What kind of traffic assessment or parking demand assessment do you anticipate undertaking in that you do refer to engaging consultants? Uh, through the chair, we're not quite there yet. We do know that we need a traffic consultant on, and it's not just traffic consultant. It'll be car parking and traffic consultant because we know fully aware when um, when Brennan Park gets developed out and then the other properties or the neighbouring properties be developed as well, that it's going to become a very possibly busy area. Um, so that's one focus with the actual roads and traffic in the immediate vicinity. And then we've obviously got the parking. So with Brennan Park, we're planning for certain stages. We need to lay the table, so to speak, for the next stages. Um, and we'll be engaging the consultant. It's part of the pre-development work, so it'll be engaged within the next six months, give or take, we anticipate. So we do need traffic information and we do need parking um, management and design here, or at least schematic and preliminary design. Thank you. Uh, my second question concerns uh, in the project charter, section 11 is satellite recreation area, which is also referenced in this summary sheet, review satellite recreation scope of work. My question is, how does this, um, uh, question or uh, set of issues relate to the uh, 2024 plan to undertake a parks and recreation master plan review. Uh, does that plan review, master plan review, relate to the issues posed here, satellite recreation area? Uh, through the chair, and the short answer is yes. Um, so for the update for the master plan, which is anticipated to be next year, um, it does coincide with the pre-development work that we're doing. Again, we're basically laying the table and creating a, some base information so that we can expand on that for the master plan. And, and finally, um, there's a number of references in the project charter to showcasing art, uh, to meaningful art, cultural heritage items, uh, opportunity to showcase. 
My question is whether beyond display and exhibit, whether maker spaces or programming uh, spaces, for example, for rehearsal, um, if you get my drift, rather than just 2D display, uh, rooms or spaces that can be programmed for arts and culture activities, how are these being taken into account in your engagement with the uh, well with stakeholders? Through the chair, we are talking with Squamish Arts and it's very early indication that those sort of spaces may be better suited for other areas um, that are not recreation. Um, and again, this is very early discussion. For example, if you have a, a room that kind of smells a bit chlorine and is a little bit, it, it may not be the best item um, and it may be better used in the civic area as opposed to keeping it at, at a recreation centre. But again, this is early discussions and all this is being brought up to work through with particularly in the arts and culture. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council, any further questions? I'll go Councillor French, then Mayor Herford. Thank you, Chair. And um, thanks, Mr. Bragg, for this update. Um, one of the slides that uh, caught my attention was the civic block. And it was noted that there are many partners um, involved in that. Will you confirm for us School District 48 is one of those partners? Is that correct? Through the chair, yes, the SD48 is one of the partners, correct. Excellent. There are many people watching that very closely, and I just want to make sure that it's clearly understood that um, we are connected with our school district partners on that. Okay, um, next one um, is the covered structure for the farmer's market. It boggles my mind that $98,000 gets us four posts and a roof. Could you talk a little bit about um, how it is that a, what seems to me is a fairly simple structure like we have just across the street um, here and also um, on Cleveland Avenue comes out to costing us $98,000? Uh, through the chair. So what we've looked at there is the existing covered structures and knowing the best economies of scale that we can do here is to use an existing design um, where the geotech's been worked out, the engineering's been worked out, the architect's been worked out. Um, so $98,000 is probably more than what we need for this particular product. We haven't dove into the details of it yet. We're literally just starting the schematic design, um, knowing that if we've got any extra budgets for this, we'll be adding it to furniture or we're making a larger structure if we can. So it's a good point. Okay, good. Um, I feel a lot better after having heard that about $98,000 as the budget. Go ahead, Mayor Herford. Thank you for all the work and the, the, the update. Um, I, I clicked through to go deeper into the Brendan Park piece as I think it's really interesting how it's sort of evolving over time. And um, there were comments earlier around, you know, parking and the traffic considerations. And um, I think that the transit integration is is also crucial here, very central to the to the community. And um, and I'd like to see some consideration around bike parking expansion. We, we've heard from folks as they transition to e-bikes and those bikes are more expensive and have different sort of security needs and or expectations for maybe being undercover or having access to power, you know, like just things that we haven't really been considering in our bike parking um, standards, but I, I would like to see um, given consideration in um, in these in this planning process in, in particular. Um, I was curious where the um, I, I like see the rationale for the moving of the the change rooms and the sort of what, how that all sort of fits together makes makes sense. I was wondering how that was having walked around there, scratching my head, trying to figure out how how it could happen. Um, I'm supportive of that direction, but it seems that um, in earlier designs, we had this um, wellness center sort of concept. And where does that, um, that seems to have been just not not there. Can you speak to to the, um, the thought process around um, what we had been looking at as a, sort of that wellness center piece? Uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, as we evolve through this process, the goalposts do move a little bit um, and, Councillor Anderson did refer to before that, you know, parking could be an issue here and parking will be an issue. So even with the current design without the wellness centre, I think we're going to be, just, and you're looking at, you know, looking five, 10 years, 15 years down the track here, um, which is what we need to design for. Parking will become an issue here. 
Um, we have discussed internally about the possibility of moving the wellness center offsite, which is a satellite recreation um, area. And again, this will be brought up next year when the master plan comes and gets um, reviewed there. Um, so I don't have a specific answer at the moment, but I do know that uh, we're very, very pushed for, uh, for space on that site. Thank you. That, that makes sense. Um, I just have one more um, piece, I, I guess, is the, the splash park location at pool configuration is different than what I was sort of had been sort of expecting through, throughout this. And I'm, I'm happy to see that it's evolving and it'll all make sense in these buildings, these sort of facilities need to speak to each other. Um, but I was curious about how um, sort of given that this is a, the Brennan Park piece is a longer term, uh, but the, the splash pad uh, piece is more immediate. Um, what consideration has been given to like this, the space between, because the goalpost could move again after we've put this piece in and we're kind of committing to needing some change room and washroom facilities accessible from the outside or, or, or something like that. And how is that sort of um, timing being considered as this, as these plans um, evolve? I threw the chair. That's a good question. And that's probably one of the main reasons why we're doing this pre-development work. Um, yeah, as we evolve through Brennan Park, we don't just want to, you know, renovate one corner of it and leave the rest of it. And by the end of the day, we've got all these renovated areas, but they don't really quite talk to each other. So it's imperative that we get in and work out, um, you know, even down in the amount of utilities, um, you know, do we need to increase the electricity in the, in the mains coming into the building to allow for future expansion here? And again, you know, where do families park or where do people park when they use the splash park? And then how do they use the washroom facilities? And then how do they come inside? And when they do the change rooms and the shading for it? So all of that's been considered with this master planning. Um, where all the departments are talking to each other and the consultants are on deck as well to make sure that, you know, we're not flattening Brenning Park and starting from scratch where you can put all these things together as you plan along where I'm um, adding to this, but we need to make sure that everything's connected in a, in a very functional way. So just to, so when the splash, when, when we land on the location and, and so on, um, it will be, um, does that come back to, to council before it goes or is the budgeting just allocating the budget is our, our input there. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm concerned that it works from day from day that it works well from day one. And that's my, my main concern. Through the chair, um, it will be located in a position that we don't have to move it in the future. So we'll be coming back to council to update where that's going. Um, again, we don't want to be putting any items within Brennan Park, you know, if we need to move them to allow the pool to go in there. So. Thank you. I'll go to Councillor Pettingill next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, there's actually been a, a bit more uh, commentary and questions about parking than I was uh, expecting, but I'll jump on the bandwagon. Um, uh, I, I guess I'm wondering what sort of assumptions we're making about parking and, and I guess where that's coming from. Are we just sort of assuming that there's going to be an X percentage increase in, in usage at Brennan Park because of the size increase and therefore we need a same X percent increase in parking? Or I guess to my mind, you know, this is a youth focus and an activity rec focused area. And so I might expect to see a, a more aggressive mode shift here than in other places. And so I would expect different parking assumptions going forward here than maybe other places. So, so what is underlying sort of uh, the analysis we're doing there? Through the chair, we're not quite there yet to even determine what we need. Um, so that will be over the next few months, it'll, it'll start to develop. Okay, thank you. And then I, I think I heard a comment on the pickleball is we're not sure about the number of courts. We're looking for extra budget. I mean, I think council decided the 370 was what we are comfortable with. Um, and so when you speak to extra budget, does that mean coming back to council for another ask or is that where the pickleball association, those conversations are happening? I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. Uh, through the chair, apologies, it may have been my wording. Uh, we understand the budget is X, which is what we're working to. We're not we're not anticipating to come back to council. Um, what we're waiting for is the proponents to come in to see what we can get for the budget that we're sitting at at the moment. Anything above that, um, the Pickleball Association will have to help and go back to funding um, from their side of things. So we're working to an X amount of budget and we're not coming back at this stage um, to increase that. Okay, thanks. And then just the final, so I, I understand we wanted to uh, understand some of our broader planning for Brennan Park before we situated and move forward with the uh, splash pad. But my understanding too is that we have CAC money for the splash pad. So just to be clear, once the location piece is settled, we have the funding, we're ready to go on that. 
Through the chair, yes, we do. We'll go to Councillor Hamilton next. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for updating us. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, an effort just to keep track of this, yet alone to keep us updated on all, all the things. Um, following up, so first of all, on Brennan Park, um, I'm encouraged to see a cafe of some kind there. I think that that can really serve to be um, a community space. Uh, I know of a lot of parents that hang out either while their kids play hockey or while their kids are in the pool or whatever. Um, and there, there would be, uh, I think it would be highly used. Um, regarding parking, um, I'd like to reflect on the, uh, obviously if you're developing a recreation center and there's experts involved, they know. Um, but when you're, when you're taking kids to the ice rink, uh, my, I'm not a hockey parent, uh, but I see parents coming out of the, of their cars and the kids are got huge bags of hockey equipment. Um, there's certain uses like hockey that will be challenging to move to other modes of transport. Um, one of the ways that I think we could accommodate that is by having similar to the uh, waterfront, uh, the, the marine access is to have storage facilities or locker facilities that people can use over a prolonged period of time. So if the hockey team has a storage facility, you don't need a parent taking the child's hockey equipment to and from uh, the rink on a constant basis. Um, I think it's things like thinking like that that may help us actually reduce our um, driving and parking demands. Um, and the third item on the splash pad, uh, picking up on, I think, uh, Mayor Herford's point, um, I'm struggling to see how a splash pad could go on the right side, the right hand side of that pool expansion uh, before the pool expansion happens, because uh, that's. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to see how that splash pad could go in before the pool expansion. Are we are you seeking any kind of feedback on that? Or is this picture just a totally preliminary concept that we shouldn't put too much depth in? Uh, through the chair, it's the latter there. Um, it's preliminary. I wouldn't put too much depth in there. Um, what we're doing is fitting the jigsaw puzzles in and we're close to fitting them in. We still got a lot of work to do with dealing with other consultants, um, the community, um, and getting further information here before we actually start saying, hey, this is where things are going. Any further questions, Councillor Hamilton? At this point? No. No, All that's right. it. Thanks. Not seeing any other hands, I'll put myself on the list. Um, picking up on the master planning document that you shared, and thank you for that, and appreciate it is preliminary. Um, I think one of the risks is that when we have preliminary information, people sometimes uh, think that that's what's going to happen going forward. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to what type of community engagement we're expecting to do on that master plan and when that might occur, if any. Uh, through the chair. So we need to have our information um, somewhat assembled and shortlisted and then bring it to the community for feedback, engagement and input. Um, we can't go to the community unless we um, roughly know where certain things are. So for example, if proposing to put the splash pad in a certain area, we need to have to talk to the, you know, the geotech and um, the surveyors and everyone, which we're just about to start that process. So we're creating a rough option um, area, I suppose, so to speak. Um, then we'll go to the community, we'll get the feedback from the community, and then that product will get finalized. Um, and that's a process that's happening over the next six months. Okay, that is helpful to know. Um, and also just in terms of, so I know that we did a lot of work a handful of years ago on reimagining Brennan Park and the expectations there with the community. Um, I still remember last term, it was actually a comment that Councillor Race made uh, when we were looking at revisiting that work uh, and there was talk about putting an extra eight lanes in the pool and he was like oh i never actually thought that that was part of the process i thought it was an expansion of the pool but didn't realize it was a doubling in size um and i remember that very distinctly because i was like he was still around the table when they did the reimagining brennan park and there was a lot of fulsome discussion and i think that there was mixed understanding about what an expansion of the pool looked like and so is the assumption here that it'd be a full doubling of the eight lanes or is that still a question that's 
up for discussion as well. Uh, through the chair, um, it's up for somewhat discussion, but at this stage, we're looking at a doubling of 25 meter pool with eight lanes. Okay, uh, that's helpful. Uh, and also just a pet peeve of mine, when consultants and architects use anal or try and pull uh, some uh, inspiration from other communities, uh, try and make it so that it's actually replicable or at least in somewhat expectation form. So the example that's given in the architect's uh, package is Clearview in Alberta. Um, Alberta's annual operating budget is $3.1 billion. Uh, and ours is sub 100 million. And so I just want to be clear with the community when we put out kind of comparables like that, uh, that the images aren't going to be what we're going to see at the end of the day here in Squamish. And um, just want to be really cognizant of that when it comes forward. Uh, I know that's not you, that's our architects who are doing it, but just really uh, being clear about what the expectations are that we're setting out in those pictures. Um, I did have one other question, but it was answered in your presentation. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, I just want to, um, the questions about the pool. So the, the current pool, I believe, is funded largely by the SLRD. Um, do we have funding expectations from the SLRD for the next, are we making assumptions or have we had discussions or do we know what that relationship might be going forward? Through the chair, again, we're at the beginning of the process here. Um, all government and non-government partners are uh, a, a viable option right now. So we'll be talking to the SLRD at some point. Council, any further questions for Mr. Bragg at this point on our real estate and facilities master plan update? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Hamilton. Um, thanks. Do we have a list uh, when I think about the recreational facilities, um, there's a, a list of, um, community groups who are experts in a particular area. And I think of the Sorka bike park, uh, the skills park right across the, uh, the parking lot at Brennan park, um, as a good example of something where, um, we have in that example, we've really handed over the management of the project to our local community experts in the project. Do we have a list of local community expert clubs? Um, I'm, I'm sure there's hockey clubs, um, swimming clubs, dance clubs, gymnastics clubs. Do we have a list of those community partners that we're specifically going to be communicating with and consulting with to f get their impact, th their input specifically? Uh, through the chair into a yes. Great. Not seeing any other hands. Yeah, go ahead, Mayor Herford. I was going to move re move receipt. I'll second that. Do you have any comments? Um, I'll just uh, reiterate my uh, thanks for for the work and for the window into the work. And as much as the preliminary uh, pieces, you know, raise raise questions and concerns, and uh, I do appreciate sort of the um, the 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 look into the process, particularly the the Brennan Park um, piece, and and uh, it's great to see the designs um, evolve with the um, particular constraints of the. Uh, of the current building and the renovation uh, um, and the ability to, or lack thereof to, reno to, to renovate it. So um, yeah, th thank you for that. And I look forward to um, to the next steps. Councillor Pettingill. Yeah, I just wanna thank staff again. And, and just, um, it felt like a very casual conversation in, in many ways, but there's really big numbers attached to these things. And I just wanna highlight, uh, making this all happen is not as easy as I feel like this conversation has made it seem. And so we have some, I, I think probably some tough discussions and decisions still ahead, uh, but thanks staff for all the work and, and seeing the things like the fire hall on time and on budget. Councillor French. Uh, speaking in support of the motion, uh, Councillor Stoner, I will um, throw my support behind your comments about Clearview, Alberta. Uh, Great facility, great pictures, great design. And if that's the expectation we're sending out to our community, we're going to be in big trouble. Uh, I'll make some comments as well, not seeing any other hands. Um, and just thank staff for the report. I, I have to reflect that 
Mr. Bragg, when you joined the district, I uh, don't even know how not that many years ago in this role, uh, your reports to council, I think, were three pages long. There were two file files in a public works facility, and the report stopped there. And now it's 11 pages long, and you have things like dog parks and covered structures and Brennan Park. Uh, and one, it's really exciting to see that we're moving through the list of, of big projects. Um, but also, I just want to thank you for your ongoing work in, in shepherding all these really big projects um, and seeing some of them complete is, is really encouraging across the board from folks around this table, but also for our community. So um, thanks for keeping all the jigsaw puzzles in place uh, and moving them around as things shift around you. Uh, so thanks for the ongoing work. With that, I will call the question on receipt. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Bragg. And with that, we will take a 15 minute break. Oh, oh yeah, motion to close first, moved by uh, Mayor Herford, second by Councillor Greenlaw. And we'll take a 15 minute break so that we can uh, take down the room and we'll come back at 4.05. Okay, what's that? Oh yeah. We need to vote on the motion to close. Anybody opposed to motion to close? Seeing none, motion carries unanimously. Thank you.